Members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee. You're welcome uh, to use your mobile devices once you've placed them in the appropriate mode. Uh, any declarations of financial or other relevant interests related to today's business, now would be the appropriate time to declare that, if members can do so. If not, then we shall proceed. There's apologies from Emma Rogan, and then we are joined by Linda Dillon, Doug Beatty, Sinead Bradley, Gemma Dolan and Rachel Woods via the Starleaf facility. So, uh, members are all welcome uh, to the meeting. I'll ask the clerk now to advise of any delegation of votes under the relevant standing order. Uh, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson Linda Dillon under Standing Order 1156. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, draft minutes then of the meeting that was held on the 20th of January. If members are content that they're accurate, then I will sign them accordingly. Members agreed? Agreed. All agreed. Okay. A um, couple of matters arising. There's a letter from the Minister regarding a death in custody. Um, it uh, was a prisoner in McGabry Prison, and that's at page 13 of your meeting pack, and it's there uh, for noting. Uh, there was a letter from the Minister uh, regarding the retirement of the Director of Prisons, um, pages 14 to 15, advising the Committee of the pending retirement of the Director of Prisons and the appointment of his uh, successor. I know um, most members would have been familiar with Governor Tracy. I um, had dealt with him on numerous occasions, um, and he's obviously now uh, decided to uh, retire, and we want to wish him well for that. If members are agreeable, uh, if I could write a letter just as chairman wishing him well in his retirement. He did appear uh, to the Justice Committee in previous mandates on quite a number of occasions, and I think it would be appropriate just to, to mark that if members are agreeable. Members content? Yeah. Um, item three of matters arising is just further information from the uh, FOIL group uh, to do with the personal injury discount <coughs> route at rate, and further information has been provided. It's on pages 16 and 17 of your meeting pack, and that was emailed to members on the 1st of February, and it is there uh, as additional information for members to note, and we can refer to that, I'm sure, in uh, due course. Item four is just the committee forward uh, work programme, and there's an updated committee work programme for February, reflecting the work items that were agreed at last week's meeting, and it's there for members' information. So, moving on just to item number four of the agenda, it's the oral evidence session with the uh, the Bar of Northern Ireland in respect of the Criminal Justice Committal uh, Reform Bill. Uh, a copy of the written submission is included in pages 27 to 33 of your meeting pack, and an initial summary. Of the key issues raised in the written evidence received is at pages 3 to 28 of the tabled pack. And hopefully I am able to welcome um, members of the Bar from Northern Ireland to the meeting via the Starleaf facility. And that's Michael Ford and Heather uh, Phillips. So just advise this will be recorded and reported by Hans Hansard, and then uh, a transcript will be published on our committee. Uh, web page. So I'm going to hand over to yourselves just to give us an outline of the key issues in relation to the bill, and then members, I'm sure, will have some issues they wish to raise. So I'm not sure whether Michael or Heather who's taken the lead, but I'll hand over to yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, good afternoon, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present virtually uh, today on behalf of the Bar of Northern Ireland uh, on the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. Our independent practicing barrister specialise in the provision of expert legal advice and advocacy in all areas of criminal law. We serve the public interest in holding the ministry of this rule of law on a daily basis. My name is Michael. I am the chair of the association. Join me today who has extensive training in the proceedings during the course of the career at the bar. I hope that we can get a sense of some of the issues that will be from our perspective, and we are happy to allow them to be part of our open commission already received. To begin with, we appreciate this type of commitment under new way approach, and that a number of experts have both recommended this in this area in the course of the last number of years. However, we would urge members to bear in mind that some of these cases ultimately involve serious criminal offences, which could see a defendant being deprived of their liberty for many years if proven guilty. I appreciate that the bar is in a minority in presenting this viewpoint, but our members do consider that committal proceedings can perform a useful role 
in a number of circumstances. For example, they can help narrow the issues at an early stage, which can reduce the need for lengthy trial in the Crown Court. They can also lead to evidence being adduced that become vital in pre-trial between prosecution and defence. The complete abolition of moral evidence at the committal stage is something which we believe the committee should reconsider. As members will already appreciate, the Justice Act Northern Ireland 2015 resulted in all evidence by way of preliminary investigations and mixed committals being retained under Section 78 where required in the interest of justice, allowing a district judge to order this only when persuaded that it was necessary. The figures show that all evidence is only ever used in a very small number of cases, but the retention of it is an important safeguard which is held solely at the discretion of the judge. This is something we believe is necessary. Essentially, I am saying preserving the ability of the court to hear oral evidence through the retention of the committal proceedings, uh, where it's in the interest of justice to do so, akin to Section 7 of the 2015 Act, should be given attention by the committee. The bill's other main policy objective is the introduction of the direct transfer of cases to the Crown Court for all indictable only offences without the need for a committal hearing. The rationale for such a change appears to be that this will increase the efficiency of the justice system. I have not seen any figures to support this, so we caution that it seems optimistic to forecast that the removal of this stage will significantly reduce the time taken for cases to come to trial in the Crown Court. Members must appreciate that the proposed reforms contained within the legislation will involve the front loaning of more work within the justice system, particularly given the likely impact on the Crown Court. These will only work effectively if investment into the system is forthcoming. Otherwise, delay will only be shifted from the Magistrates Court to the Crown Court, which will be expected to absorb the increase in cases. The sections of the bill relating to direct committal raise a number of concerns for us, such as whether an accused can be directly committed to the Crown Court without any evidence having been presented by the prosecution. There are also practical considerations, such as how the investigative process around the compiling of evidence on the part of the PSNI and PPS will link into all of this in a timely fashion. Indeed, it seems a distinct possibility to us the cases may just face lengthy periods sitting in a magistrate's court before they can be transferred up to the Crown Court due to delay for the gathering of evidence to support them. The bar has previously talked about delay at length in our response to the Gillen Review on serious tax offences and elsewhere, but there still remains a need for greater resources to be directed towards a more efficient, effective investigation and disclosure process. I regularly talk to counsel who have experienced encountering very late or even non-disclosure in serious criminal cases. In our experience, this is often, very often a key driver of unnecessary delay in these cases at the Crown Court. I also want to address subsect, subsection 4 8 of the bill, which relates to amendments to the process whereby the accused or their representatives can apply to dismiss charges in which they have been transferred, which they have been transferred directly, uh, 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 sorry, being directly committed for trial. This seeks to remove the use of oral evidence during these applications to dismiss, and we are of the view that it is necessary to instead retain the potential for oral evidence during application to dismiss, but only where required in the interest of justice, as detailed already in subsection 14.4 of the Justice Act, Northern Ireland, 2015. It seems overly restrictive to us for the bill to remove this judicial oversight function as an option for the court in its entirety. We would ask the members to look at this section of the bill again. I hope this provides a succinct summary of the bar's views on the bill. We would be happy to answer any questions that the members of the committee may have. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, we, we were able to pick most of that up, but I know our sound quality wasn't great at our end, so um, I'm but I was able to get the, the gist of it in the main. And in, in most of the, the evidence submitted by the bar, um, am, I, am I able to kind of categorise this as taking the view that 
the bar don't really feel that the proposed changes actually will achieve what the department is seeking to achieve. Um, one, this is primarily driven, we're told, to reduce delay. Um, and if it doesn't uh, reduce delay, then um, why change it, I suppose, is the obvious question. And then I'll, I'll pick up on the response thereafter. Uh, yes, it does appear that this is driven uh, by the department in order to uh, improve delay. But our concern, and the concern of many others, including the uh, uh, criminal justice inspector, has been that a lot of the delay is caused at the investigatory stage of proceedings, rather than when case uh, file uh, and case papers have been provided to the defence. There are significant delays that the committee will be aware of in relation to awaiting matters from the forensic, uh, 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 forensic staff. Uh, other investigations the uh, police have to undertake, such as obtaining medical reports, medical notes and records, drafting witness statements, and compiling the case for the PPS to consider. There's also been criticism uh, that when the file is submitted by the police, and this is from the Criminal Justice Inspector and their 2018 report, which the committee will be familiar with, there is uh, a criticism of the police that when the file is submitted, that it isn't uh, submitted in a satisfactory form. So we, our concern is that the real delay is being caused at the investigatory stage. And if there is a provision for direct transfer, well, in some circumstances, it may speed matters up. But overall, we think it will have a nominal impact on the significant delay there is in the criminal justice system. Okay. And in terms of... Um some of the arguments around resource. So the department's indicating that the different expenditure and resources that would be required in the Crown Court, it doesn't expect any additional costs to come about by these changes. Um, would that be a view held by the bar that the removal of oral evidence at committal hearings and the direct transfer of cases to Crown Court for indictable offences would be cost neutral? Uh, well, I haven't seen whatever data you've seen, Mr Chairman. Uh, and to try and give a bit of background, the, uh, what happens in a normal committal proceeding is that at first appearance, a defendant appears before the court. Then the case is reviewed by the district judge, usually on a four-weekly basis, whilst the police compile uh, evidence. They then submit to the PPF to consider the charge and decide on the case to stay in the matter of court or be prosecuted. That process can be six months, 12 months, 18 or 24 months. And there is a compensatory pay for solicitor and barrister for undertaking that work. It's a set fee whether there was one appearance or whether there were 20 appearances. So by removing that process from the magistrate's court to the crown court, it would appear there would have to be an application of the fee. Uh, so I don't see how this would either save money but there always is the potential that it could increase costs. But I'm unaware of the data that you have or the information that you have, Mr. Chairman, from the department. Okay, thank you. And the, the last question from me then, having kind of talked about delay costs, and then one of the arguments is around um, you know, the, the victims or the, the witnesses in a case and having to give oral evidence twice, um, you know, removing that necessity if you abolished your mixed committal type approach. Do, do you want to just give your view on that um, in, in terms of this um, basis of removing mixed uh, committals to, to protect witnesses from having to give evidence twice? Is that in the interests of justice? Uh, well, firstly, uh, there's two points I want to make in response to that, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, but firstly, I wholly understand the concerns that exist about victims and witnesses and complainants having to give uh, evidence once, never mind twice, or perhaps more times before a court. A victim in a case wants justice. I would imagine it's unlikely that they want to be appearing in a court to go over and over again the instance or, or the offence. Uh, but the first point I wish to make in relation to that is uh, our criminal justice system does provide the opportunity for special measures, direction from the judge, uh, to provide uh, facilities to assist witnesses when they are given evidence, when they're under fear 
or distress about giving evidence. The committee will be aware that there's a for live link to allow uh, complainants and witnesses to give evidence away from court to peer over a screen as I am doing now. There's also the opportunity for screening so that only the judges and lawyers involved can actually see the witness who's given evidence. There's the opportunity for sexual offences where the chief is provided by way of recorded evidence, by way of an achieving the best evidence interview, which is undertaken at the outset of the case uh, by the police. And we, of course, have uh, the victim support services. We have uh, the Women's Aid and other such organisations. We have the PPS. We have the investigating officer within the PSNI who provide support for and during the course of criminal proceedings to victims, witnesses, and complainants. So, uh, and over and above that, we have a very professional bar, very professional counsel who are highly experienced counsel undertaking these type of cases, who do not want to make the experience more traumatic for any witness, no matter what type of case it is. And there is in place a professional judge who would stop any question that goes beyond uh, the bounds of uh, 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 the uh, council's professional obligation. There's also the prosecution council who would intervene if there was ever any inappropriate style of questioning. So there are a number of measures in place to support a witness, complaining victim, no matter whether they're given evidence once or more than once. But on your very specific point about uh, trying to uh, less than the number of times the witnesses give evidence, I can understand that the motivation is to reduce the number of times that a complainant would have to attend in court to give evidence. However, it is not necessarily always the case that a complainant who attends for a mixed metal would thereafter have to give evidence at a trial. In some circumstances, I will of course accept that a complainant will have to give evidence at a mixed metal then at a trial. However, there are other circumstances which pertain. For example, a complainant may give evidence before defendant, before district judge, in a mixed committal proceedings. And then on occasion, a defendant having heard the live evidence of a complainant, with bearing in mind we've been in a magistrate's court, no judge, no jury, no wigs and guns, much uh, closer in time to the offence. A defendant will have heard that evidence and on occasion will then say, I accept what I did wrong, I want to plead guilty. And that obviously me for the trial. There are other circumstances where having heard and discussions begin before defence prosecution to see is there a resolution to the case? And if there is, that obviates the need for a trial. There may be circumstances as well where the PPS consider the evidence is prepared and perhaps believe that the charges that are being moved are no longer sustainable and may reduce those charges. And there may be other circumstances where the evidence just simply was not credible and the PPS reconsider the decision to prosecute, which would obviate the need for a trial. So there are circumstances where, because of the claim in the mixed commitment, where they do not necessarily then have to go into the trial and the case may well then resolve more swiftly, uh, Chair. As well, in terms of mixed committal hearings, it is not always the case that uh, a complainant will be called to give evidence of those proceedings. Very often, expert witnesses and more technical prosecutions will be called to give evidence. And even due to clarifications or concessions that they would provide during the course of their uh, testimony, their evidence may not be then required at trial. Again, ensuring that an expert does not have to take time out of their busy diary to attend court proceedings and also speeding up the trial process. So there is a concern that if uh, oral hearings are removed in one fell swoop with good intentions to see if complainants haven't given evidence more than once, it may actually have unintended consequences. So this is why we urge caution and ask the committee to look at this particular matter again. We say the right balance was struck in the 2015 Act, where uh, mixed middle be held 
a judge, independent judge, was of the view that it was in the interest of justice. So there is that official oversight, there is that judicial scrutiny, that you cannot simply have a mixed committal simply because you've asked for one. It is only when a judge determines it's in the interest of justice. So as I say, we believe that the right court was struck in 2015, and that's why we believe that the uh, clauses should not go forward, Mr Chairman. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, Linda Dillon and then Sinead Bradley. I suggest maybe that all members check and make sure that they're on mute, because sometimes that's what causes the feedback. It's quite a bad feedback. Um, Thank you for the presentation. I suppose I have a couple of points to make. The first one is, I think, how you outlined the circumstances, particularly around cases where there is sexual involved, around that issue of you know support from women's aid and, and victim support, and that, I suppose, I, I don't know even how to word it right, to be honest with you. But that rounded approach where there isn't any um, unprofessional questioning of a victim, that has not been the experience of victims. And I think that report after report, and particularly the Gillen report, has highlighted that and outlined it. And it's one of the reasons why we, and we all know the statistics around the, the numbers of people who actually go through the judicial process who have been the victim of, of sexual crime. So I think that there's enough evidence there to say that's not currently certainly the perception. And I think if you speak to some victims, not the reality either. And they're advocates, not just the victims themselves, they're advocates. So I have to, I suppose, in all honesty, say that I don't accept all of all of that. But having said that, I think that in terms of my own question, the process is not something that in place in other jurisdictions such as the South. And in terms of having met the evidential basis, I mean, if it's met the evidential basis under the PPS, then why do we need the committal hearing process? And I've read, obviously, what you, you have, have put in your written submission. So I'm not saying that I don't accept what you're saying, but I, I suppose we just want a wee bit more detail in relation to that. Chair, sure, I'll, I'll leave it at that for a minute and, and then come back in with one or two other points, if that's okay. Yeah, well, just in relation to uh, the first point, um, a similar issue was raised by the Chief Executive of Victim Support during a seminar the Criminal Bar had organised where we actually asked the Chief Executive of Victim Support to speak to the Criminal Bar in 2019. And at that stage, we made it clear if there are incidents where there is inappropriate questioning, we would expect that to be referred on to the bar because we do not want that to be the case. And uh, it's, it's not my experience, but I appreciate I'm not in every single court. It may be of interest to the committee to know that uh, the bar is on. So it may be of interest to the committee to know that the bar has drawn up quite an extensive program of uh, advocacy training for our membership on the examining of the examining and cross-examining of vulnerable witnesses. Now, that was due to commence last spring for obvious reasons because of COVID. That has not been possible. But uh, as recently as last week, I linked in with our education training officer to see if we can progress that as soon as possible once the COVID restrictions permit it. So if there is an appropriate question, well, uh, uh, we we would expect, sorry, I know Ms. Dillon's away, but I don't know if you're content, Chair, for me to continue. Yes, no, thank, thank you, um, Mr. Dillon's back. Uh, so if there is any inappropriate question, well, we would expect the uh, institution to object. We would expect the judge to overrule. And that, uh, the, the inappropriate question I have not seen, um, but I appreciate the views of the victim or complainants in case it may be different. Uh, but we want, we have a very professional bar, quite extensive ongoing training, and as I say, uh, very, very soon with a role like a very detailed programme of question of vulnerable witnesses. I should also say that the recording, the new recorder of Belfast, have been working very closely with the Criminal Bar Association 
to draw up a talk that he intends to deliver before Easter on the questioning of child and vulnerable witnesses, uh, and that will be conducted and uh, 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 will be available to all members of the bar uh, before Easter. So we, we take our responsibilities very seriously. Uh, I don't know if uh, Heather's anything to add. No, I think that's very comprehensive. Michael, I, I know that the bar very much supports um, measures that protect um, and allow for appropriate questions to be directed to witnesses to ensure that their experience of the justice system is not a traumatic one, um, whilst ensuring that a fair trial is maintained for all. I think Michael has comprehensively dealt with the, the proposed measures and ongoing measures that are considered in terms of providing both ongoing training and judicial oversight, which I think is becoming more um, interventionist in terms of the appropriateness and the nature of questions that are asked of victims and witnesses in sexual cases. Sorry, and I think, um, uh, Mr. Dillon, your, your second point was in relation to why are oral hearings required if the PPS have, uh, are satisfied that the test for prosecutions met? So the the uh, evidence quite often is in paper format. The evidence they're considering is just uh, quite often the statements, albeit it can be uh, quite often ABE interviews as well, considered as part of the evidence. But it is there's no opportunity until there is no oral hearing to stress test that evidence. It's simply black and white words on a page. It's part of the adversarial trial process and has been for many, many years that evidence to be tested in court. But I can understand, I know the concern about uh, witnesses, complainants and victims having to give evidence on more than one occasion. I can understand the concerns, but I would ask the committee to be alive to the point have already made that in some circumstances after an oral hearing in the magistrate's court, which again is a more informal uh, 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 set of circumstances, is held closer to the time of the defence. In some circumstances, it does obviate the need for a trial. So it actually speeds things up, provides justice to uh, a, a victim uh, and or defendant earlier. So I, I would ask the committee to bear in mind the other circumstances outlined, not simply that in every single case, a victim or complainant will have to give evidence on more than one occasion. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that, uh, both of you. And I suppose, uh, just to, to make clear, I'm not questioning the professionalism of of your profession, of the, of the, of the lawyers and the barristers, because what was considered appropriate questioning is where the, where the issue was, not not to the individuals that were doing the questioning, to be fair. And I think that's that's where, where the concern lays for me. And, and, and I do feel reassured, obviously, that changes have happened around this. And I think that's been very well supported by, by your profession. So I have no doubt that, that that's something that you can follow through on. I'm certainly not questioning the, the professionalism of, of your side or those in your profession. There are a number of reports, and you've alluded to this yourself, and particularly, obviously, the, the Gillen report is one that, that will be focused on. There are a number of reports coming from very different um, backgrounds and, and, and very, coming at this from very different angles, which all um, recommend the, that there needs to be committed reform. So whilst I, I accept what you're saying, I find it difficult to believe that all of the all of those reports are wrong, and obviously, I mean, Justice Gillan was a judge. I think that he has a fair understanding of the benefits, um, and the the potential downsides of having the committal process. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still not convinced, if I'm being honest, of the of the value of them, but. I, I've, I've heard what you say, and I, and I have obviously read your written submission. But if you want to just come back in relation to those reports, and I, I know you have already alluded to them, but I, I probably really haven't heard anything to say that those reports are not right. Just to say as well, I, I, I agree with a lot of what's in your submission around an isolation 
is of very little benefit in terms of speeding up justice. And this is what you know. This is what this is the main aim of this is supposed to be about: speeding up justice and making it easier for for everybody. That's both for defendant and um, alleged victim. So I think it is important that the department show us what else they're going to do as a package of measures that should not be done in isolation if it is something that goes ahead. So just to say that, I certainly would be supportive of you in relation to, to all of that. And so just a, a quick view from your sales then, and, and again, you've given a little bit on this, but do you think there has been much improvement between PPS and PSNA in terms of, you know, preparation of cases coming to court? Well, one of the matters that is in train at the minute, at the minute is, uh, or sorry, if I go back in time, one of the issues that has existed for a number of years is being able to get a copy of CCTV evidence or body-worn footage, which police record that are out on the street or when they end with the victim. There has been significant delay for a long time in obtaining that swiftly. And there are many remand hearings that I attend, and yet again we're being told that the CCTV is not available, the body worn is not available, and 999 calls not available. Now, to the credit of the police and the PPS, they have now in place uh, a system where the CCTV or body worn is uploaded to a cloud so that the PPS have much earlier access to the body worn footage or CCTV. However, as yet, the defence do not have access to the cloud, so we do not obtain copies of the body-worn footage or the CCTV as swiftly as we would like to. It still has to be burned onto a CD and provided to us. Now, it may seem like a very simple thing to do, but there is significant delay in that being done. The difficulty as well that practitioners encounter from a practical basis on the ground is that new computer devices often do not play the CCTV or the body worn footage. If we had access to the cloud, the PPS both have, then we would be able to view footage with our clients much more quickly. And this may lead to a lot of delay being removed. For example, if a defendant sees themselves on CCTV breaking into a car, and they can see quite clearly it's them. They will put their hands up and admit it. But if we're waiting a year to get a copy of that CCTV, human nature dictates that they defend will often sit in their hands in case the CCTV, which may be the only evidence against them, is a very poor quality. Now we're hopeful by next year we will have access to the cloud. So I have to say to the credit of the police and the PPS, that is something that we hope will assist. From 2017 onwards, the PPS have also had an indictable cases process, where in cases that if following a successful pilot in ARGS, which started in 2015, the ICP was then rolled out across the jurisdiction in 2017, which encouraged greater work between the defence and prosecution at an early stage to try and move it quicker into the crime court to try and agree issue. And if I can give you a practical example, if the police attended somebody's house and they have a kilo of a suspect item that everybody believes is cannabis, it has to be sent off to forensic science to be examined. <clears throat> However, the ICP, the prosecution can reach out to the defence and say, would your client accept that this was cannabis? And if the defendant yes, they will, that obviates the need to take up forensic science's precious time. It speeds up the case because there's no need for a, a report and a statement from a forensic scientist. And it means the case can progress to the Crown Court much more swiftly. So to the credit of the EPS, there are steps in place. I believe those types of practical measures will have much more of an impact than direct transfers or the removal of mixed metals. Okay. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to Michael and, and Heather both for, for their answers in relation to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sinead Bradley, and then I will bring in Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair, and thank you. 
presentation so far. I'm not sure if you hear me okay. Yeah, um, it's just about the, the numbers. I'm trying to ultimately measure this. Um, in terms of the numbers of cases that are currently being required to give evidence, um, we suggest that they're actually quite low. And then the proposal, that, you know, the retention of the investigation um, should be considered in the interest of justice. And you refer then to section seven of the Justice 2015 Act. And, and I'm just curious to know um, the numbers that are making it through and are still required to present evidence for that reason, that it's in the interest of justice. How would you propose that there would be a consistent approach um, across the judiciary to when that would be required? And the cases that currently are going through um, are they filtering through that process now? Would they be reduced in number if your proposal was to be upheld, or is that the current status quo? Thank you. Well, the, the latest figures that I've seen are from 2017. I think they may have been included in relation to the sexual offence only in our submission. And unless my mouth fails me, I think it was less than 10% of the sex cases which make their way to the Crown Court have uh, oral hearings, uh, which means 90 plus percent are dealt with just on the papers, with the judge in the papers, with the witness not having to attend. And that is applying the current test that a district judge has to consider uh, whether it's in the interest of justice. So simply because a defence defense barrister or defence justice says we want a mixed committal, it doesn't automatically mean that there will be one. It has to be if it's in the interest of justice. Now, I know you, uh, there are obviously, um, I, I think, in around 28 magistrates' courts throughout the jurisdiction. There are a similar number of district judges as well. And I hear your point in relation to standardisation. What I can say about our district judges is this. Unlike in England and Wales, where many of the magistrates are not legally trained and not full-time professionals, uh, our district judges are all legally qualified uh, either previous solicitors or barristers who have extensive experience quite often in criminal law, either as prosecutors or defend, uh, 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 defense lawyers. They have a very, uh, they are highly experienced dealing with uh, upwards of 100 cases per day in court, and each and every one of them is highly professional. Uh, they have to apply an interest uh, of justice test across many decisions that they make in all sorts of applications, this is not the only type of interest of justice uh, test that they have to make. It's regularly applied in very many uh, types of circumstances, whether you're trying to uh, uh, have evidence rules in municipal or deal with certain types of applications in court or even dealing with uh, legal aid applications and things of that nature. So it's a test they're very familiar with. And there is the prospect, if they misapply that test, that their decision could be judicially reviewed by either the prosecution or the defence, and to perhaps give the committee uh, some comfort and to allay any concerns that you may have, Ms. Bradley, that in uh, 2015, uh, I am aware that you've been judicially reviewed if you've misapplied that test. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Chair. Um, could I also ask then, in terms of you know the the committal process, um, regardless of where your opinion stands on it, I suppose there is a body of work that happens during that point in time. And would it be your opinion that obviously you know in, in the interest of justice that work will still happen? Um, would you say that filtering that the committal process has? Do you see most of that shuffling downwards to PPS, or could it be the Crown Court that most of it will shuffle upwards? Because I can't see how this won't have an effect on resources at you know either of those two points in the system. And I'd be interested to know, in your opinion, where you think that body of work will shuffle to, who will pick it up, and how labour-intensive or resource-intensive you think it might be on those bodies. Thank you. 
in relation to direct transfer cases, so cases that would normally be managed in the magistrate's court but now go to the Crown Court, well, we do have some concerns because at present, it does at times take months, sometimes well over a year, for cases to be uh, uh, ready for uh, trial. There is significant as I've been in investigating. Now, transfer, sorry, at present, as you explained, uh, as I've already outlined, sorry, uh, so, sorry to repeat myself uh, or to labour this point, but a case is managed by a district judge in the magistrate's court until it's ready for committal. That's what happens at present. So usually every four weeks, a case will be reviewed. The district judge will ask for an update on progress. And if they believe there's some slide or believe that, uh, that things aren't being done swiftly enough, they can, for example, ask the investigating officer to attend and give evidence before them to try and put some pressure on to keep things moving because judges have target times to deal with cases. They're very conscious as well that victims are awaiting uh, their day in court and they're very conscious as well that the defendant may either be in custody or on bail with strict conditions awaiting their hearing. Defence practitioners also use the, the monthly remands, the four weekly remands to try and put pressure to keep the case moving. Um, if there is a direct transfer to the Crown Court, that same process will have to happen in the Crown Court, but it will simply be before a different judge. Our Crown Courts are already extremely busy. The COVID backlog has only added to that because it took until, for very uh, understandable reasons, it took until August, from the start of the pandemic, August of last year, before the uh, courthouses and ready to hear trials. And there's no criticism there because there was an awful amount of work the court service had to do uh, to put in place mitigations to ensure the court the state was safe. But if if the case is normally managed now by a district judge is moved to the Crown Court, it will simply be reviewed by a Crown Court on a judge on a regular basis. Now, just because there's a more senior judge managing it does not mean things will necessarily be done swifter. Because if you're still awaiting a consultant to provide a medical report, if you're still waiting notes and records, if you're still waiting a mobile phone to be triaged, if you're still waiting for a laptop to be interrogated, if you're still waiting on CCTV or body worn, it doesn't matter which judge is getting angry about that, whether it's the Lord Chief Justice, a Crown Court judge, or a district judge in the Magistrates Court, if the resources aren't there to deal with the investigation, things will not be dealt with swiftly. I think back to a now retired judge, Lord Justice Weir, former Court of Appeal judge, who was previously the senior criminal judge in Northern Ireland. He often complained at the delays with forensic science in high court applications, often across the media complaining because of delays and because of defence spending significant time in custody in their trial. However, with the greatest respect, even though one of the most senior judges in the country was raising concerns, it did not stop the delay. So I have a concern that following the direct transfer, our already busy crime courts will be even bigger and will be clogged up with these administrative, administrative issues about delay in the investigatory procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Uh, Rachel Woods. Hi, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Heather and Michael. Um, I have a few comments, just but like Linda and others, I do have some sympathy with you in terms of what you're saying of the rationale of this bill, if it is indeed to speed up justice. Um, I think it's important that there are other measures, you know, to be looked at and, and if it goes ahead and in terms of the delays in the justice system, I suppose I'd be eye open and experience of reading a secret barrister over Christmas. So I actually understand what you're talking about now, which is good. Um, but you just on a on a detail there, um, you mentioned about access to the cloud, and that to me seems like a very simple thing that should be done. You mentioned then it would take the next year for defence to access it. Could you explain to me why? That would take nearly a year for that to happen is it gdpr is it something that needs to come through in regulations what what's the delay there 
I, I can't answer that because I don't know the specific reason, but as far as I'm aware, PPS have only recently had access to the cloud. So I would imagine, given there's technological involvement, uh, it just is going to take some time to make sure there are no teething problems and to ensure that it's ready for a rollout because there's 600 plus barristers in the country. There are, I believe, over 2,000 solicitors uh, in around 600 firms. So the, there is a significant rollout that will have to be done to all members of uh, both branches of the profession. So I, I don't think there's any uh, deliberate delay. I think we would all like to see this done as soon as possible. I can't give a direct answer. I'm sure if the PPS are appearing before you, they could. Uh, and I believe they may be appearing before you in uh, due course. Uh, so they may be able to give you more detail. But I don't think it's, uh, I certainly do not think it's deliberate on the part of the PPS. I think we'd all like to see this rolled out ASAP. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. I certainly will direct my question towards them. I suppose what I was just trying to get at, if there is practical things that we can do without having to do legislation on certain things, if, if it is indeed to speed up justice, um, it should be getting done. Um, but you'd mentioned about resources needed throughout your submission, um, and I appreciate that. What would need to be speeding up justice again if it is the rationale for removing committal process? We have touched upon a lot of it already, um, but is there any other areas that need addressed in your opinion to speed up justice where it is needed? Of course, because not all cases in the justice system need to be quick. Although you know, we're dealing with with criminal justice, um, so it it shouldn't always be done at speed. Um, but just in terms of anywhere else that um, you think that we could be looking at in terms of speeding up uh, the justice system? Well, first, I completely agree with you that things should not just be done quickly for the sake of it. Uh, cases have to be prepared properly, and that's from the prosecution side and uh, the uh, defence side as well. Um, there are often significant delays with forensic science, uh, be that very serious cases where they're examining firearms, be it when they're uh, the, uh, they, uh, dealing with drugs cases and things like that. Uh, there are significant delays with the police in terms of triaging mobile phones and interrogating laptops. And that is somewhere where we're noting, noting significant delay. Uh, there, uh, there is now a wealth of information on mobile phones and laptops that wouldn't have been the case 10, 20 years ago. If there were more resources focused there, that could really speed cases up. Because even by the nature, and I'm not going into the detail of some types of cases, but if there is information found on a mobile phone or a laptop which is demonstrably owned by the defendant, well, that is quite compelling evidence. It may take a year, two years more to get that information, but once it's received, it is likely uh, in a lot of circumstances to lead to a plea of guilty. If that type of uh, evidence was obtained swifter, it may then well lead to an earlier plea of guilty. Uh, so those are two areas that I think should be the focus of the committee of trying to deal with uh, uh, investigative delay. The PPS have target dates for uh, having uh, making a decision in the case. The judiciary have target dates as well for case completion, and they try their best to stick to those. But unfortunately, due to investigative delay, that can sometimes mean that those targets are reached. And I've already referred to the, the box system, as I understand it's called in England. That's the access to CCTV, body worn, and other audio and visual uh, on the cloud. I don't know if that's quite what the PPS and police are calling it, but also in England's referred to as the box system. Once that is rolled out, we really would hope that that would improve a lot of the delay. So I understand why the committee reform bill has delay at the forefront of its mind, but I'm concerned that it will not lead uh, to uh, the, uh, the improvements in delay that uh, the bill uh, hopes to, or sorry, the department hopes to achieve. I think there are other things that could be done that would speed cases up. And I have to say, just to emphasize this point, I have never met a defendant who doesn't want to get his case finished swiftly. I've never met a lawyer who doesn't want to get the case finished swiftly. It has to be done efficiently, as you quite rightly say, uh, Rachel. It has to be done properly. It has to be prepared properly. 
but uh, defendants, victims, lawyers all want cases dealt with quickly. There is no benefit to anyone in delaying cases being dealt with. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. Um, uh, third question um, is one it was touched upon earlier on, but what do you think the impact on legal aid would be if this um, bill went through as it is? Uh, well, part of the issue is this. I still don't quite understand what the direct uh, uh, tr uh, transfer, direct committal will look like. If committal proceedings are removed, I uh, don't know whether first appearance or a magistrate, the case is then transferred to the Crown Court, or whether it's case managed for a period of time in the magistrate's court and then is transferred to the Crown Court. And I think this is something we may wish to ask the departmental officials. What is their plan? Because at present, I can't read it from the bill. Is it at first appearance they want to transfer the case? Or is it halfway through the magistrate's court proceedings? And if it is at a later date after first appearance, well, what is the trigger for, um, uh, for transferring it to the Crown Court? Is it when a decision has been made, there's sufficient evidence to go to the Crown Court? Is it when certain witness statements, statements have been provided? What is the trigger for uh, moving it? Because I understand the queries about legal aid, Lawyers will still be representing their clients. The lawyers are still entitled to payment for the representation uh, that they provide. But when we don't know precisely what the mechanisms are of the system, it would be impossible for me to comment on what type of implications that would have on legal aid. So I think it would be very useful if the committee could follow up with the department. Is it at first appearance they want to transfer a case to the Crown Court? or is it at some later date? And if it is at some later date, well, what is the trigger for them transferring? What has to be in place to transfer it at that stage? Because if a case is transferred to the Crown Court, the other query is, well, will counsel for prosecution and defence be instructed at that stage? So for example, if the direct transfer takes place at first appearance, well, is defence counsel instructed? Is defence prosecution instructed? to see if the progress that can be made in the case to narrow issues and perhaps discuss resolution, or does that come at a later stage? Because the timing of involvement of prosecution, counsel and defence will obviously have an impact on the aid. So at the minute, there are some unknowns out there, so I simply could not answer your question. I think it's more a matter for the department to address. Uh, thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. Certainly will. Um... I, it's not an area of, of criminal justice system that I pretend to be in any way an expert on, so I will be ta um, taking that up because I don't understand it myself. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Paul Frew. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. Can I just say that I, I think I caught most of your commentary and your answers. I didn't catch it all, though, because of the system we're using here. It's not adequate, I believe, for scrutinising legislation. That's not your fault nor mine. Uh, so we'll try and proceed uh, as best we can. Can I ask, and I hear, I think I've heard everything you've said and the answers you've given. And if I do ask a question that's similar to something you've already answered, please forgive me. But we, we have this sequence where PPS is involved and you have to go through tests, certain tests with regards to uh, reasonableness and uh, conviction, chances for conviction, all of that, my terminology will, will not be correct. So if, if PPS are doing the job that they're meant to do, explain to me the, again why we really need a necessary le uh, stage of committal. Uh, well, uh I, firstly, I agree with you. Uh, we are operating uh, most of our courts, the vast majority of our courts, online at present. And similar to yourself, Mr. Frew, I would like to see the return of uh, in-court advocacy rather than over a computer screen. So I completely empathise with your position, and I would much prefer to be in the Senate chamber right now making my remarks and answering questions uh, rather than appearing on a screen. Uh, but I appreciate we are where we are right now. 
And you're quite right, the PPS have to apply a two-stage test before uh, a, a person is prosecuted. And that's the evidential test. That is, is there enough evidence before a prosecutor to determine that there's a reasonable prospect of a conviction? And then secondly, a public interest test. That is, is it in the public interest to prosecute this person? For example, if they are a person of advanced years with a clear criminal record and a very minor offence has been committed, it, is there a need to prosecute them at all? Or can that be diverted away by way of a, a caution or a warning or something of that nature? So that's the test that EPS have to apply. But they're applying the test based on written uh, statements. They are not applying the test on evidence that has been challenged in court. And it has been the case in our justice system for many hundreds of years that evidence is stress tested in a court. And the reason for that is simple and straightforward. If the prosecution put you on trial, you're entitled to challenge that evidence. You're entitled to have the prosecution prove their case and prove it to the immutably high standard of beyond reasonable doubt. It is the prosecution to prove their case and for the prosecution to prove it to that very, very high standard. And the reason for that is simple and straightforward because an innocent person should not be found guilty of a crime they did not commit. So there's a very high standard. It's for the prosecution to prove. But when they're making their decision whether to prosecute, they're basing it largely on written or documentary evidence, not having the test, not having the evidence stressed in court. Because we do operate adversarial, uh, an adversarial system here not an inquisitorial system as is in place in many European countries. So the committal proceedings are the first stage in being able to test that evidence. And at times, as outlined to the chair, at times after that evidence is stress tested, a defendant will turn around and say, I've heard the evidence. I know what the case is against me. I know my defence will not stand up to scrutiny. I'm pleading guilty. There are other times as well where having cross test the case, the prosecution may look at the charges led and may reduce charges which may lead to a And there may be other circumstances where the evidence has been stress tested and the prosecution, as they continuously have to do, reapply the test to prosecution and come to the decision that uh, there is no longer a reasonable prospect of conviction. So it is the first stage in that process of stress testing the evidence. So I understand where you're coming from. I understand the prosecution, which is staffed by very experienced and very able prosecutors, will apply that test to the evidence in front of them. But the committal proceeding is the first opportunity to test that evidence in court. Then with that, uh, is it not the case that the Crown Court could do just as good a job as uh, in weeding out unjust or speculative prosecutions uh, and in that save both defendant and witness or witnesses uh, the, the real traumatic rigmarole of, of being or having to give evidence in court? Because, because in the best one in the world, most people who hasn't have never entered the world of, of the judicial system, a courtroom's a courtroom, whether it's the Crown Court or Magistrate Court, for them it's a very serious place, very scary place in a lot of, of cases. And if you've just went through a shock trauma of, of being a, a victim or alleged victim, I suppose, if I keep my wording right, or have experienced some sort of traumatic incident in your life, that was uh, that was needing to be tested as criminal. Going into the court is one of the most unpleasant experiences anyone will experience in their lives. You you guys know that, but you guys are in the court every day scenario. The witnesses and defendants aren't, and so maybe maybe it should be the case that this bill is not so much about speeding up justice, and that in itself is a very serious thing, but just trying to limit the shock trauma 
or the re-echoing um, of trauma that defendants and witnesses would have to go through. So I suppose to get back to my question, c could, the, could the, the, the High Court not do that, uh, or the Higher Court not do that just as well as a magistrate's court? And I get that you then push up a delay in another court, but, but you're, you're still cutting out a level that does take time. And with time is frustration. So you have built somebody up, defendant and witness, you've built somebody up to get to a certain date, and then you go through a rigmarole, and then there's further delay. And then those people are told, well, look, you will have to do all this again. Um, so that's the first question. Could the Crown Court or the Higher Court not do just the same job? And then do you have any percentages of, of where the committal proceedings go with regards to how many then go on and mature to a higher court and then how many are actually, for want of a better word, thrown out because they are unjust or speculative? Because we are talking about a small percentage of cases going to committal. So out of that small percentage, what, what percentage, percentage then goes on to a higher court or then gets thrown out as being speculative or unjust? Well, uh, in relation to your first point, um, if you don't mind, I'll go back to your initial remarks about how given evidence on a live link is not an appropriate way to scrutinise legislation. Um, and I would prefer, as I say, to be before you to allow you to ask me questions in person because it is a very important function that this committee and MLAs perform in scrutinising legislation. But you have to bear in mind, I was invited to come along and give evidence today because, again, it's a vitally important role that the Assembly has in scrutinising legislation. And we want the opportunity to ask not only me, but the Law Society, the PPS, the Department of Justice questions to properly scrutinise and to do your job effectively. Now, the same right, the role that lawyers are doing. It's not simply the case that we can put a set of papers before a crime court judge and say, Judge, you decide whether this person is guilty or not. We have to stress test the evidence. We have to scrutinise the evidence. And it's best done uh, in a court arena. I appreciate there are many cases, in many cases where the defence counsel agree that witnesses should give evidence on a live link or give evidence behind the screen. Quite often the defence agree that those that should be done but it is so important in the same way as you are all doing your role today to scrutinise that evidence, to uh, stress test that evidence, because it's not until that's done that you can get down to the real answers. So they, could the Crown Court do the same role of scrutinising uh, that a magistrate does? Well, if they were allowed to have oral hearings, then yes, as a part of the direct transfer procedure. If oral evidence could be scrutinised and stress tested, yes, that could be done. We say it's better done at an earlier stage in a magistrate's court. It's better done by uh, in a, a different environment where it's done swiftly, where it's done closer to the uh, commission of the alleged defence, and where it's done in a form where there's no wigs and gowns, where it's done in shorter proceedings by way of a mixed committal. But if it was left by way of direct transfer, to the Crown Court judge, well, they should still have the opportunity to stress test that oral evidence in the same way as is vitally important that uh, the uh, uh, Assembly stress tests and scrutinises legislation before it. In relation to your second question, in relation to the percentage of committal proceedings, well, first you're quite right. There are only uh, about uh, 2,000 defendants per year before a crime court. There are many more in the magistrate's court, can be upwards of 40,000. So there's quite a significant difference in the numbers that the two courts deal with. And, uh, but I would not have uh, the percentage of cases to hand where uh, committal proceedings are dismissed. I imagine the department would have ready access to that. But that's not the only statistic you should look at respectfully. There, it would be important the number of cases there are mixed metals, and then what happens after that? 
where the committal is dismissed, yes, but also what happens after that at the Crown Court? Do the cases resolve or do they go to full trial? Because I imagine quite a number of those cases would resolve and it would be interesting, it would be difficult to find out, but the both statistics could give some steer as to whether those uh, mixed committal hearings have uh, moved the case towards a point where it can resolve at a later stage. So I think it would be important, and I think you're quite right to raise the question, what are the statistics for the number of cases that are dismissed? But the second question should be, what are the number of cases then that go to full trial, and what are the percentage that resolve before trial? Because that would answer the question as to how many cases, particularly in sex cases, where a, a complainant has to give evidence more than once. I would imagine in uh, looking at the entirety of the Crown Court cases, it's a very, very small number. OK, thank you. That was very, very informative. Can I ask then about the range of offences that uh, and pieces of legislation that are going to be repealed if this bill passes in its, its, its guise as it is now? One of them is terrorist-related. Uh, the question I had put to the, the department was, uh, if, if, if a defendant just happened to be a terrorist, but it wasn't a terrorist offence, and there was witnesses with all the pressure that would apply. Do you think that, that sh if, if this bill goes through in its guise, I know you've uh, principally you know, objected to it, but you, you get my point with regard to uh, a defendant who just happens to be a terrorist and a terrorist offence be, could be two different things. Do you think that that, is covered, uh, that protection is covered for the witness in this bill? Uh, well, you're talking about a circumstance where somebody is either a convicted or a suspected terrorist, but they have committed an offence of burglary, for example. Yes. With all the power, with all the power and persona that that individual would bring, uh, and the pressure that that person could bear to a witness, uh, same principle, I suppose, to a jury, uh, and then of course the diplock system, but. You can imagine the pressure being applied on a witness uh, if, 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 that, if a terrorist and someone who's known in the community, if you like, uh, is, is a defendant in, in, a, in another incident, as you say, burglary or, or such like. Should that become... Well, first you're quite right um, to state that uh, if somebody is either up on a terrorism charge or is uh, has suspected involvement with particular organisations, the director of the PPS can issue a certificate to say that the case should be tried without a jury. It doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, an offence under the Terrorism Act, for example. It could be any type of offence. So that provision is in play and that provision is quite often utilised. And there's very little challenge to uh, the director's decision. Um, but we do have quite uh, strong laws on protecting witnesses. If a uh, defendant was charged with an offence and did try to intimidate or try to have a third party try to intimidate a witness, well, they could face additional charges on top of that. And that's a protective measure. And once the witnesses have already gone to the extent of making a complaint to the police, they would obviously have a police liaison officer that they could link in with. And if other offences such as intimidation did arise, there would be the opportunity to make a further complaint uh, to the uh, police. Thank you. Uh, looking through some of the, the summaries of e evidence that have been given in the organisations, you, Michael, and your, your colleague must feel a bit like salmon. Uh, swimming against the tide in that regard. Uh, so this might be an unfair question, but if you thought that you were going to lose the battle of this bill being passed in some guise, but you did, you, you, through your experience, your daily experience, have ideas of how to quicken up the justice system, as you've outlined in some cases today, uh, you know, have you considered what should be in this bill by way of amendment rather than just having it the blue pages as we see now and you guys saying no we don't support this is is there been any work done by your organization to say well look here's what we think should actually happen 
and here's what we think those clauses should actually look like. Well, uh, I think you have some this well. We appreciate it very much in the minority. But I would say, uh, with respect to the other report, that uh, the purple bars of the use of the bar account, so the prosecution and defence barristers and the solicitors on the ground are the ones dealing with these type of cases day and daily from both sides, prosecution and defence. So we have a good sense and a good feel for cases on the ground. So I would ask the uh, I appreciate we're in the minority, but I would ask the committee to give some weight to the submissions we've made, both in writing and uh, uh, orally. Um, in essence, we think the 2015 position is a satisfactory position, so we would not like to see uh, the uh, clauses one and two in the bill. But you're asking me what else we would like to see if the bill is passed. Well, firstly, all the matters outlined to Ms. Woods about uh, how uh, investigations can be improved and made quicker. We think that would have a more demonstrable impact on uh, delay. Uh, so I would ask the, uh, I'll not repeat them, but if you could bear in mind the comments I, I made to uh, Ms. Woods. But over and above that, uh, we do need more flesh and bones from the department. And again, I repeat what I said. I think questions should be asked to the department. Is, how do they expect direct transfer to work uh, in a practical day-to-day -day basis? Are they saying that at first appearance before a magistrate's court, the case is transferred to a crime court? If it is transferred at first appearance, is a prosecution barrister to be appointed? Is a defense barrister to be appointed, as happens automatically in crime court cases, uh, to manage the case and to try and progress the case? to narrow issues and to try and ensure that it is resolved speedily? Or is it the case that that tr direct transfer will only happen at a later date? And if it is at a later date past the first appearance, what is the criteria that has to be reached to move the case there? Because if it is the case that there is provision for direct transfer, but it only comes when the full file is ready, well, that pretty much mirrors what already takes place and may not uh, have the impact that the department wishes. So um, it's not so much what else would I like to see in the bill, it's the additional information I would like to see about the pragmatic outworkings of the bill. And I think it'd be pretty important for this committee to ask those questions of the department. I would be very interested to hear those responses. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair, for letting me back in. Michael, just, you've actually just pointed to, to it in, in your previous answer to, to Paul, those questions that should be put to the Department, and, and I think you're 100% you're right. It's helpful to us. Just has the Department actually engaged directly with your says about that process and how it would work and, and what your thoughts and views are on it? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I know the uh, department had engaged with our chief executive some time ago because I did see a PowerPoint presentation that was provided to our chief executive, which he disseminated. I don't know if Heather's any more information because, uh, sorry, whilst we are all talking today, or the vast majority, Heather was the person uh, assisting our policy officer and also uh, uh, another barrister called Joe Keith in putting together the written submissions. So, sorry if I've taken over today, but it was Heather who's done all the background work. So, don't know if Heather's any more information on any other engagement with the department. Not at all, Michael. You have you've managed today exceptionally well, and I'm very grateful for Michael um, dealing with the questions. Um, in terms of direct engagement uh, from the department, I, I, I'm not appraised of any specific um, engagement that has taken place. Um, so. The, but to, to perhaps revisit Mr. Frew's question in terms of matters that we, we might like to see included, one of the, the big concerns that we bar have um, in terms of the implementation of this bill is um, delays and, and how the justice system would cope with um, delays. And we've had the benefit of reading the submission from the Law Society and one of the suggestions that has been implemented across other jurisdictions was the implementation of time limits and statutory time limits, which might be of benefit 
um, in terms of reducing delay or at best managing delay. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. And I think that's exactly what Paul was alluding to. Is there is there anything, you know, if this this bill was to go through as it is, is there anything that we can do to improve it? Because obviously, and I mean most of us have alluded to this, we're we're questioning you on the basis of our understanding of this. But you are the people who we you know best and, and none of us are doubting that. That's why why we're asking the questions we are. So it's not because we know more, it's because we know less. Um, so I, I think that that is helpful. And sure, I would suggest that we put the questions that, that Michael has asked directly to the department and ask for answers on those specific questions, because I certainly would be interested to hear them. And I think it would be helpful to us as a committee in terms of, of moving forward. So thank you to, to both Michael and Heather for, for answering the questions there. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, Paul for it. Yeah, just a wee quick one there on Heather, you, you've bounced something in on me there. Uh, with regards to the time restrictions and limits, but where 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 would you where would you see as being best practice around the globe uh, or near a field here, Western Europe? Where where do, would you see uh, best practice with regards to time restrictions and limits and, and limitations on court and how what dangers or negatives would there be with that prospect also? Well, I think from the overall picture, in terms of the global picture, what we can see is that everybody has really taken uh, their own approach. And it is difficult. Each, each single division seems to have very much the pluses and negatives. One example, I think, is whereby the Republic of Ireland appear to be considering the introduction of committal proceedings, or the equivalent of committal proceedings, in order to reduce delay. And here we are talking about the removal of them to reduce delay. So I think um, I think it is very much a case of whatever way you look at it, um, everybody has a different opinion because the bar would very much say that committal proceedings do have a purpose in the very few cases in which they are uh, utilized. They are utilized very productively and I want to sort of lead on from the fact that Mike, where the point that Michael made in terms of when statistics are being examined, that what should be examined is in those cases in which committal proceedings are to take place, how many of those, those hearings then do in fact proceed to a full trial because many of the issues have been fleshed out at that very important early stage where issues can be narrowed minds can be focused, especially in cases where there is a predominance of expert evidence and detailed expert evidence from a number of different sections, whether that be ballistics, whether it be forensics, minds can be focused at a very, very early stage. I suppose that's where we're coming from in terms of where we're saying that we support the, the retention of the interests of justice retention element that we think it is important for our magistrates to retain in order where those cases in which a committal hearing, including that in oral evidence, would be essential and necessary in the interests of justice, i.e. that it would speed up justice or, or deliver it in a better fashion, that that could be still retained at this stage, which may well actually truncate the fullness of the trial procedure. In terms of if um, delay uh, time limits were going to be imposed. I think it is a matter that perhaps greater um, evidence gathering would have to be completed before one could definitively say that we would recommend this specific time limit um, being implemented. And I say that for a number of reasons, because one can look at other jurisdictions and how things work in other jurisdictions but other jurisdictions are different and have a number of different and relevant factors specific to their own jurisdiction. Whereas um, I think uh, in terms of this jurisdiction and very much in terms of resources, they are inextricably linked. Um, and if one imposes a time limit that is unrealistic, it is simply going to be surpassed time and time again. Um, and so I think that if the committee was minded to include elements of that as considered by 
our learned friends, the law society, then I think further investigation would have to be conducted in terms of what would be both realistic and in the interests of justice. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Sinead Bradley, and then members, I'm going to wrap this up because we need to keep the, the items moving. So Sinead Bradley is the last one, and then we will conclude this element of the session. Thank you, Chair. I will be brief. Um, yeah, just I, I, again to thank Michael and Heather, and I think that really has been helpful. And I do recall that we did have a um, presentation on some of those operational proposals, but it would be really helpful to know um, that I, I would like to say that that level of detail was in front of Michael and Heather, so we can take their view on whether the objective, and I do agree with the objectives of the bill, but I've yet to be convinced that the bill is achieving them. And I would I would appreciate your view when that operational data, um, for want of a better expression, is available to you to see the weight and, and whether you feel that the objectives are being achieved or not. And I think perhaps the committee chair um, through you that we we should have access to those considerations going forward. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure if Michael or Heather want to come back on that comment from Sinead. Well, just to say we're more than happy uh, to provide any further uh, written information if required. Uh, we're also uh, more than happy to work with the committee on this matter and any other matter. Um, what I should say as well, I know in previous years there's been an invitation extended to the committee that at any stage, if any of the committee members want to come and join to the criminal courts and shadow a barrister, even if it's for half a day, to see the inner workings of what took place on a day-to-day -day basis, we are always, always more than happy after that to be done. So at any stage, if any of the committee members or any members of the Assembly wish uh, to spend some time on the ground with members of the profession, please do get in contact with the Bar Library. We'll be more than happy to facilitate that. Okay, um, Michael and Heather, can I thank you both very much for um, taking the time to spend with us and if there's other areas that we want to follow up on with yourselves, we'll, we will certainly do that, but thank you for today. Um, thank, you, thank you. Okay, members, in terms of the, the issues raised both in that written submission and um, questions that uh, members had asked and points, uh, we will be pulling together as with the previous um, domestic abuse uh, consideration. All of these issues will be put together um, by the committee staff and we will get a, a corporate response on all of them from the Department of Justice because we obviously have the evidence sessions next week with the PPS and the Law Society. And so once we have those evidence sessions, we'll collate all of the various areas that we then want to send to the department and we'll get a comprehensive response to all of them. So uh, rather than each week identifying, which we've done today, and then writing to the department and then following that up after each evidence session. We'll pull that all together um, after next week if members are content with that approach. Okay. Item five then is the draft budget oral evidence session. So the relevant papers for members is pages 35 to 197. And um, the responses from the department's non-departmental public bodies to the committee's request for information uh, on likely implications and potential pressures are on the tabled papers for members. So hopefully I'm able to uh, welcome officials from the Department of Justice, uh, Lisa Rocks, Deputy Director of Financial Services Division, Andrea Quayle, Head of Financial Planning, Strategy and Support, and Louise Blair, Head of Financial Planning and Support as well. So um, the session will be reported by Hansard and transcript then will be published on the committee web page. So I'm going to hand over to the officials at this stage and then we'll follow up with some questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Can you hear us okay? We can hear you, no problem. Excellent. Um, so good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to update the committee on the department's draft 21-22 budget. I'm joined today by Andrea Quayle, Head of Financial Planning, Strategy and Support, and Louise Blair, Head of Financial Planning and Support. support. Today, we would like to provide you with an update on where we are in terms of the 21-22 budget. But before I do that, I would just like to touch very briefly on the in-year position. We remain on track and we continue to manage the position very closely, 
it has been a very challenging year with much uncertainty. The Department's January monitoring round position will be reflected in the spring supplementary estimates once it has been agreed by the Executive, which we expect to be in February. The only change since we attended the Committee in December has been the £1.2 million easement from the Northern Ireland Prison Service, which we have noted in your pack today. This has been surrendered to the Department of Finance as part of the January monitoring round process. We will brief the Committee on the Department's spring supplementary estimates in the coming weeks ahead of the Assembly debate. This is a fairly technical briefing, but the key aspects of the Department's 2021 budget were reflected, which will be reflected in the spring supplementary estimates or in the January monitoring round briefing, which the Committee has been briefed on to date. So in terms of the 21-22 budget, the Executive agreed the draft budget on the 18th of January, and the Finance Minister provided a statement to the Assembly on the same day. The Department of Finance has published the draft budget document, which includes details on the budget consultation with responses due on the 25th of February. I know the committee will want to feed into that process, and of course we are also keen to hear your views to help the executive form a final budget before the new financial year. So in terms of the draft budget for the department, this is a non-ring fence resource Dale budget of £1.1 billion and a draft capital Dale budget of £96.4 million. It is important to be clear about what this budget means. The document published shows a budget uplift for the Department of 5.1%, which on the face of it could appear to be quite favourable. However, it does not compare like with like. The draft resource budget is simply last year's baseline, rolled forward, plus funding streams which are added to the budget in previous years, so we're not in the starting figure. These include £31.2 million of security funding from Treasury, £10.7 million of funding relating to EU. The draft budget also includes £8 million of funding for the Tackling Paramilitarism Programme, which, was do which does not normally sit in the DOJ budget, but is held centrally and agreed by a cross-executive programme board. And finally, it includes £4.2 million of legacy funding. If you were to take the £4.2 million as the only new money, which is earmarked for legacy, the draft budget represents less than half of a percent of an uplift, so is close to a flat cash budget. This funding had been requested from DOF for legacy purposes. After taking account of this, there is no additional funding to set against inescapable pressures, including pay and price inflation and other significant pressures, which total £55.7 million, of which the committee is aware. In terms of capital, the capital budget or the draft capital budget is £96.4 million, which includes security funding from Treasury for PSNI of £0.9 million. This overall capital allocation would be an increase of £8.3 million when compared to 2021 allocation and is sufficient to meet inescapable capital requirements as identified in the future year information gathering exercise. We are currently working through a refresh of capital needs given the passage of time since the original information was gathered. Following the Minister's consideration of this information, spending areas will be advised of their draft 21-22 capital budget and we will update the committee accordingly. With a total of £152 million pounds worth of bids, there will be a degree of reprioritisation and rephasing to be done, but it is a reasonable draft budget. So in terms of what this all means, in terms of the non-ring fence resource Dale, as I've said, this is broadly flat cash. The committee have been briefed previously both on the impact of the flat cash budget, and it is clear that some difficult decisions will need to be considered given the magnitude of the pressures we face. Now that we know our draft budget, we are engaging with our spending areas to ask them to update their budgetary impacts based on the budget set. We hope to have that information this week, which will inform the Executive's consideration of the final budget and in setting the final budget for the Department once final allocations are known. The Committee will be aware from the information gathering exercise that a flat budget would have a significant impact on the Department, particularly as 70% of the overall budget relates to staff costs, making inflationary pay increases and immediate pressure. Key issues we know we will need to consider are Given the PSNI budget is effectively flat, 
it is likely PACE and I will have to reduce police numbers. Other areas they may explore would be in line with the information gathering exercise, which included lack of investment in the police estate and removal of managed services, which means police officers and staff performing these, ro these roles, taking them from the front line. For the prison service, a flat cash budget will impact greatly the regime that can be delivered to support people in their care, to address their offending behaviour and will greatly reduce capacity to deliver safe, decent and secure prisons. This could include options such as closing Burren House, reducing non-uniform grade staff, a reduction of prisoner earnings and a reduction in the learning and skills provision. Within the courts and tribunal service, the impact of a flat cash budget will mean they are likely to need to look at staff reductions, which again could adversely affect across all operations. As I've said, once we've received the information on the impacts of the draft budget across all spending areas, this will be used to inform consideration of final budgets. The department is aiming to publish an overview of the draft budget and the equality impacts on the website this week to inform the draft budget process. There are a number of areas in which we understand there are ongoing discussions around funding. Firstly, in terms of EU funding for PSNI, as part of the draft budget, £9.8 million was allocated to PSNI against a requirement of £15.5 million for 308 officers and staff. This is similar to the position in 2021, where we secured the balance as part of the in-year monitoring process. We understand discussions are ongoing with Treasury to secure the balance and along with PSNI, we are continuing to feed into that. In terms of COVID funding, in setting the draft 21-22 budget, the Finance Minister set out draft allocations, primarily for health and education, but leaving a further £127 million for consideration as part of setting a final budget. Given the pressures forecast in 21-22, the Department will seek additional funding given the requirements across the justice system, including police and prisons. In addition, the committee will be aware that the department bid for an additional £16 million of funding from the New Decade New Approach Unique Circumstances funding exercise in late November. The four bids, which were included, totaled £16 million or in respect of tackling paramilitarism, the Gillen review of serious sexual offences, speeding up justice and additional police officers to facilitate delivery of the NDNA agreement. The department has not received an outcome of this process. In terms of other funding streams we normally bid to, we understand discussions are ongoing around funding for the Tackling Paramilitarism Programme and the TBUC funding. On a separate issue, I am aware the committee has written this week asking about the consideration being given to identifying funding for known future pressures, including any work with the Executive Office in relation to the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. The DOJ was designated by the Executive Office to put in place the necessary administrative arrangements for the, Trouble, the Troubles Permanent Disablement Scheme on behalf of the Victims Payments Board. Any pressures relating to funding for the scheme fall to the Executive Office and does not create a pressure on the DOJ budget. In that context, TEO has confirmed they have been provided with a draft allocation of £6.7 million in the 21-22 draft budget, which will allow the implementation arrangements for the scheme to continue. In conclusion, I hope I have provided a useful overview of where we are in terms of the draft 21-22 budget. It is clear there will be a very real impact of seeking to absorb the pressures within a flat cash budget. And of course, as ever, we are keen to take the views of the committee as part of the draft budget process. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to brief you today and we're happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, a couple of quick questions for me. Just to clarify, there was a £16 million bid for the new decade, new approach um, areas that interface with DOJ, and that included for additional police officers to reach the 7,500 target, but you haven't got uh, a response to that bid yet. Is that what I picked up? No, we haven't had responses yet. Um, within that £16 million bid then, how much of that relates to the PSNI um, police resources for uh, increasing their personnel? It was £3.5 million of the 16 in 21-22, which was for an additional 153 police officers. 
Okay. Um, so we're awaiting a decision on that, but based upon the the uh, initial allocation that makes up the draft budget, you've indicated that that will lead to a reduction in the current uh, complement of police officers. Are you able to quantify how many police officers that the force would be reduced by? I can't at this point. Um, we're due to have responses by tomorrow, and of course the policing board have a role there, so I don't have. I've had side of early figures, but nothing confirmed as yet. And in terms of the uh, current funding that the police receive in respect of the uh, Brexit uh, for, directly from London, um, wh when will there be an indication if that funding is going to be continued and secured? Well, as part of setting out the draft budget, I suppose there are two elements. There have been the ongoing discussions between DOF and Treasury about the protocol funding. So. DOF have been seeking the full £15.5 million that the police require in 21-22 for the 308 officers and staff. But in setting out the draft budget allocations, um, the Finance Minister has set out a reinstatement of previous baselines, which would provide the PSNI with £9.8 million towards that £15.5 million. But of course, there's still a shortfall there to which DOF continue to argue to Treasury to secure, but we haven't as yet had an outcome of that. Okay. Um, so the, the, the global figure of inescapable pressures is just shy of £56 million that the department is facing in terms of its resource budget. Um, how is that going to be plugged in terms of what you would anticipate the different uh, units within the department and NDBPs coming back with, is that largely going to, to be redundancies because it's heavily um, staff reliant in terms of those costs or are there particular programmes um, and projects that the department is going to have to consider stopping and, and what would they be? I suppose it's hard to be definitive about that at this point until I've seen the responses but it was clear from the information gathering and also from 70% of the budget being in staff, that it's quite likely that there will be staff impacts across a range of the bodies. But as I say, until I've seen the final responses, it can't be definitive. Uh, and is the department considering then particular uh, funding schemes, for example, that it gives out to communities as a way to, to plug that gap? Sorry, I'm not sure on your question. You couldn't clarify. So is, there, there are some schemes you know, that the department would give money out to, some projects. Um, are they going to be stopped? Is that something that's being considered? Not at this stage, certainly not at this stage. And I suppose there has been a lot of work going on in the background, particularly in the core and agencies, to look at what we might do. And a lot of that might be around things like not filling vacancies and trying as far as possible to minimise what would be a frontline impact. Okay. Let me bring in Linda Dillon and then Gemma Dolan. So, Linda first. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to um, Lisa and Andre and Louise for coming to the committee today. A couple of questions just in relation to, first of all, just around the legacy font of 4.2 million. So. It's, it's a wee bit confusing just at different points in the in the presentation and it may well be straightforward but it, it confused me slightly so it's the 1.7 million that has went to police ombudsman's office that's coming out of that 4.2 4.2 million is that right yes well i should say it's up to 1.7 million pounds to the police ombudsman depending what the requirement might be and that funding being allocated as ring fenced to the department Okay, and then the rest of the 4.2, is that all for legacy inquests? It would certainly make the balance of the pressure that is currently setting for legacy inquests, although what we do know is, following the impact of COVID, we'll need to look at what the recovery plan looks like for legacy inquests to determine the requirement. So when setting out the draft budget, the total of 4.2 is ring fenced for legacy. So I suppose we'll need to look at what you know the ongoing requirements will be in 21-22. Okay, and just in terms then of um, what you've just alluded to or in relation to you haven't got response back from, you know, you're expecting that information gathering exercise response to be back by tomorrow. 
how quickly will the committee have access to that information? Well, I suppose we need to work through the process of collating it and putting it through you know, our own internal committee and through the Minister and we can share with the committee. I'm conscious that the consultation deadline closes on the 25th, so we'll provide any significant update that there is between now and the closure of the consultation date and of course we'll engage fully with the committee as part of the final budget setting process because for me the key at this point is making sure that we've got all the information from all the bodies so we can very clearly set out what the impact is of what is a tight budget. Okay, and then there's there's a mention of COVID-19 pressures that will require additional funding from DOF. Has, I suppose, first of all, what are those? And has the Minister submitted any bids to the funding from the available pot in the current financial year in relation to that? And just a tiny add-on to that, an easement of 1.2 million um, ring fence COVID-19 budget was surrendered. Could that not have been reallocated in anticipation of next year's pressures? Um, to sort of break it down, the first one in terms of any requirement for additional in-year funding for COVID, uh, we're on course for a balanced budget, so we didn't need any additional funding. We do, of course, keep a close eye on what's going on, particularly with the PSNI, to ensure there are no additional requirements in-year. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of the 1.2, you know, there was no requirement for it anywhere else in the justice system. In terms of next year, unfortunately, we're limited in terms of you know, there's no carry forward facility, so we can't carry forward any money into next year. And I suppose we're in danger of kind of spending in advance of need, you know, that those costs will only crystallise in 21 22. Okay, and um, have there been any other bids made then in respect of the budget surplus for the remainder of the current financial year? Not from us, no. Okay. Um, Right, those are my questions for now, Chair. I, I may want to come back in just before we finish, but okay, that's me for now. Okay, thank you, Linda. Gemma Dolan. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just have one question, and there's no reference to any EQIA in your briefing paper. So, given the significant sum of unscapable pressures identified, there's likely to be a negative impact on a number of Section 75 groups. Can you give more information in regard to any EQIA that was carried out? Um, I'll look to I'll sort of I'll hand over to Andrea for some of the detail. But as part of the information gathering exercise, we did collect the information on the potential impact on the Section seventy five groups, and were able to screen out so a full EQIA is not required. Yes, on the information received in the returns, a minor impact is considered across all of the Section 75 categories and the further quality impact assessment is not required. Um, the Department has reached the outcome that the policy is screened out. However, as part of the, the final budget consideration, the quality screening will be reconsidered as that, at that stage. <laughs> well, it's important too to say we're very keen to get that onto our website, to get the details onto our website in the next sort of couple of days. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, everyone, for your presentation. In relation to the, the COVID-19 um, budget, £36 million pounds seems to be uh, earmarked for next year. How is that um, expenditure justified? I suppose we, we feel we're well into the, the COVID crisis, and we do appreciate their continuous demands, but uh, it does seem excessive. I take it as across what three or four departments we're talking about. Um, we're talking about 36 million. I last year uh, the estimates I think came in about 12 million uh, per department. Just how do we justify uh, this expenditure on COVID at this stage? And does it include overtime, for example, in relation to the police and the prison service? Um, well, I suppose the first thing is that £36 million was the bid that went in as part of the information gathering exercise for 21-22, and we're in the process of revisiting that in the context of what we now know. So, for example, you know, the impact on legal aid hasn't been as significant. The courts are starting to come back, so the impact on perhaps income mightn't be as significant. So we're in the process of revisiting that, and I imagine, you know, as we said at the time of the briefing, that's potentially a worst case. In terms of things that are in there, um, £11.1 million of it 
related to social distancing and PPE in the prison service and £8.7 million pounds in PSNI for the same purposes and also including IT. Um, but I suppose we're revisiting it at the minute and it's important to recognise some of it is not spend, it has potentially impact on income that's lost but of course as ever we'll closely monitor it but with £126 million pounds available across the block if we have bid for something in that region it may be that we're looking at the impact of not actually securing the funding. Very much an estimate at this stage. It is. Yeah, right, okay, thank you. Uh, Appendix A um, is page 47 in our report the proposed draft non green fence resource deal. Um, the prison service, 106 million. Um, obviously, quite a large uh, section of expenditure there. Um, and obviously the police are the major factor, 728.6 million. Uh, in my notes I made earlier, I was going to ask the question, you know, how does the PSNI show value for money in their management and processes and procedures that they have in place to ensure that they're making effective use of the resources? Do you have... Um, was... Sorry? Do you have any evidence on that or do you look for that evidence uh, in relation to the request for such funding? Well, I suppose in terms of any significant spend, the PSNI would present a business case to the department, which we would consider in terms of value for money. So that would be one place where you know, we would have very clear visibility on specific new areas of spend. I suppose if you were to break down the police budget, the significant, as with our budget, about 70% of their budget is in staff costs and after that sort of managed service. So there's very limited room to manoeuvre in the police budget, but anything that is certainly new would be subject to a business case which we would scrutinise in terms of value for money. Yeah, I think it is something that needs to be looked at, you know, considering what you've said earlier, that there's now pressure on, on or there will be added pressure on police resources and perhaps there'll have to be a cut. But I think we all are very much aware of the need for for scrutiny and ensuring value for money. And the overtime, for example, how closely is the overtime budget monitored and managed in relation to the PSNI? And I do know from questioning the Chief Constable and, and senior officers, they've done a programme of work on that. But how effective has that been or what evidence is there to show that they're there has been significant savings made in relation to, for example, uh, over time. I suppose there's a sort of operational aspect where, you know, the spend and the police budget, much of it is an operational matter for the Chief Constable. But specifically in terms of overtime, I do know that there have been significant levels of reductions in overtime in the PSNI over the past number of years. So it is certainly an area which has been driven down as part of a reducing budget. The overtime um, for the PSNI, obviously the PSNI have been involved in, in COVID, COVID operations. The, the, the COVID operations, are they included in that or do they come under the, the COVID funding as previously mentioned, the 36 million? Um, I suppose in terms of the COVID bids, I don't know if there's anything specific in terms of overtime that would be part of the normal police budget. It's part of the normal so it would be about what, direct, what police officers were directed to do. Okay, right, thank you. Capital Dale, um, 96.4. Where, where is that proposed? Is that capital, as we note, for capital schemes or? No, apologies. Um, in my opening remarks, I was just referring to that because. Normally, in normal process, you might have a budget around the autumn, so when the information was gathered, you would have all the detail in around capital bids, but because the budget has slipped so much, we have gone out to do a capital refresh before making recommendations to our minister on what draft capital allocations might be. We hope to be in a position to do that in the coming days, and once the minister has agreed that, we will share those with the committee. Okay. Uh, just chair, just one other quick point. You followed up a previous meeting we had about um, just about the uh, additional costs and three thousand, I believe three thousand pounds for legal aid. 
normal business, page 41 here and everything. Um, why, why is that separate from the, the, the normal legal aid figures? Oh, yes, yes, it there, yeah. Following on from response was issued on the 26th of January. Um, we talked about 3,000, it is 3,000, okay. Legal aid, normal business. Coming, sorry, under other pressures, inescapable pressures. Because that's a breakdown, I suppose, of our other inescapable pressures in the 56. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm answering your question. Um, so, because it's not in the paying price, it is just one of the other inescapable pressures that we face on the legal aid budget. Yeah. And it's directly, <coughs> excuse me, it's directly attributed, attributed to the PSNI, is it? Not legal aid, normal business. That's, that's in the legal services agency rather than the PSNI. Is it? Yeah. But why is that not coming out of the, whatever million it is, why is it not earmarked under that for, for legal aid? So is that pressure is the pressure that was submitted by the Legal Services Agency when they were assessing their forecast requirements for legal aid for next year against their baseline? So that was their original bid of £3 million pounds of a shortfall. Okay. Um, £3 million. Yes. Yes, it says here total in K. In the so that's 3,000 K, so that's 3 million. Uh, 3,000, yeah. Yeah, which, to yeah, which totals 19,000 odd for other pressures. That's yes, great. 19 million. 19 million. Millions, right, it is millions then. So that K is wrong. The table is in thousands, so the total is 19,458,000, which is 19.5 million. Right. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Just, uh, Lisa, while we were having some of those questions, we got a PSNI response in to the committee actually on the budget allocation, which would cause me a lot of alarm. Um, uh, they've provided some illustrative options as to what they're going to do, but the key paragraph, and I'll read it to you, the most significant impact will be necessary reductions in both police officer and police staff headcount and recruitment rather than increasing police officer numbers towards 7,500 as outlined under the new decade new approach. We could therefore instead experience a reduction of more than 300 police officer posts to 6,700 and almost 100 police staff to 2,470 over the financial year. Reductions of this nature will inevitably impact on a range of competing issues and tough choices having to be made. So that crystallises it very clearly in my mind in terms of the impact this is going to have on on our police service. So in, in light of you know this twenty three million pounds reduction in the PSNI budget, you know, will the Department of Justice give priority to the police service um, whenever you get your final budget settlement? Because I don't think it would be acceptable to the public that you would be having to have that kind of reduction in our police officer headcount. And I think it's absolutely right that we have that information as part of the draft budget process and that certainly will form part of the considerations of the Minister as part of the executive discussions on the final budget. So the important thing is that we have that information to feed that into the process, that it's very clear what the impact is of this draft budget. Okay, um, that'll be an issue I'll certainly uh, be wanting to, to see a priority given to um, going forward. So let me bring in uh, Rachel Woods and then um, Paul Frew. Thanks, Claire. I suppose just following on from your comments, um, and thank you for coming to committee today. I mean, I haven't had a chance to go through all of the information that was given to us in the table pack from some of the um, the other bodies that are funded from DOJ, including the PSNI, but. Um, there's a similarly grim situation with which has been put out by the probation board um, and it's not just police services um, it's all services and those then that are funded through non-departmental bodies the community and voluntary sector that we know pick up most of the, the legwork um, with, with people 
um, and keeping people safe. So this is not a this is not a good situation at all. Um, and certainly something that I will be be raising. Um, picking up on Gordon had mentioned about business cases and some of his questions, and they were scrutinised for value for money. Is value for money the only way in which business cases are scrutinised, or are outcomes and impact on people also part of the the, the process? All of that would be part of the process, but value for money is one of the considerations. And is value for money value for money the heaviest weighted? No, I don't know that I would say. I think it's a it's a consideration of the full case and what it's setting out to achieve and looking at the affordability of value for money as part of that. Okay. Um on the I don't know this um, has been brought up in a number um, of things and, and, and budgets, um, but we'll obviously have lots of different departments um, would feed in or could feed in um, and work together on certain aspects. You know, we're looking at say things that probation board may or other other bodies may fund, but would have impacts on communities and also have impacts on infrastructure or other departments has there been any discussions of pooling of budgets then um to, in order to you know affect certain things that you know we don't want um we don't want certain you know projects and, and pilots to go um but has there been any discussion if there is this case where um everyone's been asked to make cuts because of this um this budget process um any discussion with other departments on pooling of budgets no, there hasn't been, and I suppose ultimately what we'd seek to work towards would be the programme for government, you know, where we would seek to align resources to the outcomes in the programme for government. And that's the programme for government that's out for consultation at the moment? Yes, but ultimately it will move towards a multi-year, in line with NDNA, if that's delivered, it would be a multi-year budget in line with PFG, but yeah. <laughs> Um, and if I could just okay. offer a health warning, Rachel, sorry, on the probation board point, I suppose I just want to give the health warning that the department haven't got the responses yet. And I know, for example, in the probation board, there are a range of funding streams as are applied to a number of our bodies for whom the funding is allocated in year. So when they receive their initial allocations, there could be concern around things like funding they receive. So, for example, in the probation board, I know they receive funding from the tackling paramilitarism programme and they will receive funding from problem solving justice. So those are things which are not in the baseline budget, but could be perceived to have a big impact. So I think this is where in a normal process, we would have an eight week consultation. So we would have the ability to work through this and then the department come to the committee with a fully informed process, you know, whereas we're working under a really constrained timescale. So I suppose it's just, it'll be important that the department has an opportunity to see what those impacts are. And if we can help inform the committee as part of that, we will do that. Thank you. I will appreciate that. Um, I look forward to knowing what a normal budget process looks like. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> so far, it's never quite new. So this is, if, if, this is, uh, if this is not the way it usually is, then that's okay. Um, no, and it, just, it was just the probation board submission that I managed to read before today. So it, it, um, it's not just singling them out. Um, in terms of the um, departmental priorities then for 2021-22, has that been discussed and has the prioritisation exercise based on this draft budget been done? I think our prioritisation will now be informed by the fact we have a flat budget. So, you know, that will force us to have to prioritise more because we haven't received all the funding that we would have required. So those conversations are ongoing. Okay, and in terms of the priorities, then will the committee be updated on what the departmental priorities are for the next financial year? I might defer that one to my business planning colleagues. Okay. Um, Chair, just on uh, for another one for me then, um, the Nightingale Courts, has that been submitted for next financial year under COVID bids? Um, the Courts, um, Rachel, Louise, um, the Courts have flagged a number of uh, COVID pressures that they're refreshing. However, I suppose back to those those bids were originally put, submitted in September. And I suppose that the Nightingale Courts are really only within the last month or so really getting established. 
So um, they have an indicative, or a, a sort of planning assumption or working assumption that they could extend the, the Belfast one to the end of June, but I know they're keeping that under review. They're not significant costs. Um, you know, they're um, 250,000 for the, the three months up to the end of June. So that would be part of their overall pressures. But as Lisa said, we are refreshing those costs. Okay. Um, no, I think they, uh, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, the allocation for the Nightingale courts that they have at the moment is just until the end of the financial year. That's right. They're they're managing that from within their existing allocation. Okay. They were able to manage that, and to be, you know, I think in September when they were submitting their their bids, they wouldn't miss necessarily have been advanced enough in their planning to know what they would maybe need for twenty one twenty two. So we'll capture that as part of this update. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just to, I know Gordon had touched upon legal aid there. Um, I'm just wondering if there maybe a specific one for me. Maybe you could come back to me. But has a bid been? Uh, made um, to the Department of Finance or even if, you, if you're aware um, within Legal Services Agency for the Domestic Abuse and Family or Civil Proceedings Bill soon to be act in Section 28 with regard to the Legal Aid um, Clause that is now section of the bill? It's not, it's not included in the current bids that are there um, and I understand the colleagues are seeking to understand what the potential repercuss of cost may be of that. Okay, so there's been no no bids put in for the next financial year for active activating section twenty eight. No. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'll not take up any more time, Chair. I'm sure I'll uh, raise some more issues at some other stage. Rachel Paul Frey. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I say first of all my deepest uh, and sincere sympathies to you. you? You did get the budget late. In the process, from what would usually be the case, although I don't think we do anything usual here, it's always unusual. Uh, and of course, that was out of your hands, and in fact, out of the Department of Finance's hands, considering the budget uh, review in, in Westminster. So, uh, my deepest sympathies for you uh, and, and the work you guys have to do in a very short space of time. Having said that, of course, uh, I, I'm interested in what you say about the monies left over for the structure uh, for the structure of of about um, the pension scheme for the people who have been victims and, and who have been hurt and damaged and disabled by terrorist atrocities and, and, and activity. Repeat to me again the money that's in the budget for that so my understanding is that the executive have provided an allocation of £6.7 million in 21-22 to the executive office, which will enable the implementation arrangements for the scheme to continue. How much, sorry? 6.7, as Six. I understand it. 6.7. So it seems to be the case that the executive office uh, identified pressures of something in the range of 21, I think, 0.6 million. Do you know that figure, where that came from? Have you had any engagement with the Executive Office about that, whether that was for apparatus or whether that or structures or whether that was the actual pure funding for pension? Um, I suppose there's a couple of things. In terms of the DOJ budget as such, in terms of the scheme, it won't become a pressure on the DOJ budget. Um, I am aware that there were bids submitted. There was the £6.7 million, which is in the draft budget for the implementation arrangements, which probably will come then across to us in terms of administering the scheme. But I am aware that there was a figure of around £22 million that was required for making payments in the next financial year, which was not part of the draft budget. But again, in terms of the DOJ budget, you know, what costs will be incurred will be recouped so, but I do know that in terms of if the funding hasn't been confirmed in terms of making the payments, and our minister is on record as saying that although the executive office is the accountable department, securing funding for the scheme is a priority for the executive. Does it not strike you uh, in the Department of Justice that you may well be getting this money to put up a structure that won't actually do anything if there's not money coming forward for the actual funding of the pension? And how does that sit then with audit? Well, 
ultimately a decision on whether the scheme will open will be for the Victims Payments Board and at present the priority that the Minister has said that securing funding for the scheme is a priority for the Executive. So we continue to take action to ensure that the scheme will be ready to go when the funding is available. So I understand that and I understand it's not your responsibility or remit to, to bid or to find that funding and money. But have you as a department had any uh, orchestrated conversations and joined up working with the Executive Office and indeed the Department of Finance in order to try and find this funding? And the point I think you raised at the start of your presentation was about the committee writing to find out if we can use or utilise any of the money that could well be left over in this year's budget. So you imagine the scenario whereby the day before the, the financial year ends, you have could be in the reams of hundreds of millions, uh, and the next very next day you're going to send that back to the Treasury. That in effect becomes Treasury money. Is there any mechanism that you know of that that money can be secured or saved, which then could go into the pension fund directly, which then could be utilised by this department, uh, who could well be and should well be the administration department for that funding? Well, I wouldn't be delayed in terms of the engagement with the executive office. Um, that would be another colleague. But in terms of, I appreciate the point that you're making, if there's unspent money this year, whether or not that can be used this year or next year. But my understanding of that is that that falls under the bounds of the budget exchange scheme, where the executive is, set, is sort of sought a limit of what could be carried forward. And so it would be up to them to consider in terms of setting next year's budget. But in terms of the budget exchange scheme, I think, and I'm not an expert here, but I think that you're talking about figures in around about 80 million. So I don't know whether, you know, in the context of a flat budget and the impact on the executive, I think there are many difficult decisions there. Yeah. So, so that brings me to my point about the flexibility that would need to be secured. So if you're the administration department for this pension scheme, uh, we will not know who uh, yet who will apply how many numbers apply at the one time at the start and then of course the duration of that scheme and the money spent on that scheme will be to do with life expectancy throughout the, the rest of the years. So again, is there any mechanism where you can add flexibility, a further flexibility to the budget? Uh, because it, you would be gazing into your crystal ball on a yearly basis, asking for money on a yearly basis for a fund that could go sky high at any time and then wouldn't really cut off, if you know what I mean. So so the, the parameters here for this pension scheme could be mighty. And I suppose for me, you know, I would have to defer to colleagues, you know, the executive officer involved in looking at the estimates for the scheme, but in purely financial terms. There's no impact on the DOJ budget in terms of the flexibility. I don't think that's currently there, but of course, as part of the discussions around that scheme, I'm sure those things are being explored. How do, how do we how do we square the circle whereby we have commitments in the what's it called the new decade new approach deal, uh, whereby the executive will increase police numbers to seven thousand five hundred. Uh, it's very clear, a very, very small sentence within that political agreement. But here we have a department who, because of their budget settlement, will actually be going in reverse direction on that commitment. Uh, is there an accelerated passage where you can get the Department of Finance and the Executive Office, I'm sure, into realise the significance of that? The, the actual momentum that would be lost and the damage that that would do to confidence, not only in law and order with regards to police numbers, but on the, the establishment itself with regards to the agreement that was sought and agreed on, which got these institutions back up and running again, that within a year, police numbers are going in reverse, not increasing to the commitment and the promise, which was the executive will increase police numbers to 7,500. 
And I suppose that's, you know, as part of the draft budget, we will make all of those points. Um, and I know that as a, the block didn't receive much money, so there wasn't much money available. But as part of the draft budget, we will feed in all of those points. And, and I suppose, is there a... Is, can that then be a trump card, if you like, because it's contained within the NDNA deal? Is that something that that propels that bid up above every other bid? I suppose that's not for me to determine. You know, it's for the Justice Minister to consider in terms of priorities and to feed that into discussions with executive colleagues as part of setting the final budget. Okay, thank you. So we're in this strange scenario whereby we have got the budget late. Uh, the budget settlement or the review late from Westminster, so you guys are all scrambling about. The Department of Finance, uh, the Minister, he has produced his draft budget, although he hasn't actually laid the draft budget in the, exec in the Assembly as yet. Uh, and that's a, whilst he has made a statement, he hasn't actually laid it, so there could be an issue there. There is also talk in the Department, or sorry, the Committee of Finance and most definitely the chair of that committee, whereby he may not uh, wish to support the department in considering accelerated passage. Now that would be an, that would be a decision for the assembly, not any committee. Uh, but the committees are meant to be uh, assured that they have scrutinised the budgets appropriately. If the committee can't say that and they won't support accelerated passage. Have you done any sort of scenario planning as to what finances will look like if the Department of Finance doesn't get accelerated passage and the Permanent Secretary then would need to step in with the order which would only allocate, I think, is it 65% of the budget at the start of the financial year and then 95% of the budget in July? The well, spring supplementary estimates would provide cover for the continuation of spend. Um, in terms of scenario planning, we work closely with the Department of Finance and take their advice on the requirements. And at this point, they continue to advise us to work under the draft budget and to inform the consultation. So, so just so I'm clear, the spring supplementary budgets will give you authority by the exec by the assembly to spend. Is that correct? And how much? Mm -hmm. I don't know the percentage off the top of my head. Um, the spring supplementary estimates provide authority for cash, to run cash um, for a number of months into the new financial year. And we've had to use that in a couple of years previously when there wasn't a budget in place at the start of the financial year. But what we did in that scenario, and again, I'm sort of speculating here, we might try to operate under indicative budgets. But again, at this point, DOF have not provided any advice that that should be something we should be looking at. And of course, that's different from so spring supplementary estimates is different from the actual budget bill, uh, which yes. will be in two stages: one this financial year for the next year, and then also the the budget bill then in June, I think, usually uh, for the rest of the spend. So there is that intricacy. But but with regards to the self the spring supplementary budgets, that gets you clear and authorizes authorizes you to spend money. Uh, in the event that a budget isn't passed at any given stage, is that correct? It includes a vote on account. I'm going to look to my colleagues because it's, it's fairly technical and it's not something that we use very often, um, but it includes a vote on account which allows cash to continue to flow in 21-22 until there would be a budget in place. <coughs> are, are your colleagues there? I think there's nothing else to add. Okay, nothing else to add? No. Nope. Am I hearing that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with regards to Probation Board, this is a, a again uh, very much like Rachel, this would concern me also because a lot of the work of the Probation Board is behind the scenes work on preventative uh, aspects of the criminal justice system, uh, also about reoffending. Uh, is, has there been any sort of scenario planning as to what a cut in their budget actually means on the ground with regards to a rise in crime or a rise in court, which then adds on to the rise in 
uh, uh, support with regards to court in the guise of, and what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, um, as part of the original information gathering, we did look at the impact and did talk about potentially reducing headcount and probation board talked about their ability to fulfil their statutory functions and provide safe probation. But until I see their final return, um, I can't comment. But I suppose there are a few things to go in there. The problem solving justice funding, which we have in the baseline, would be allocated in year. And programmes such as SPARE would be part of tackling paramilitarism. So we continue to argue for tackling paramilitarism funding. So there are some things still to go in there. But the scenario planning at the minute is based on the information gathering until we have an opportunity to see what they're saying their impact is to inform draft budget. Okay, and again, you didn't write the, budget, the draft budget, the Department of Finance did, but, but your section, page 44 and 45, like the rest of the document is very high level and talks about how the budget com uh, aligns with the draft programme for government commitments. But what we don't see, and this is something I've been crying for for a long, long time, is a complete alignment between programme for government and budget. All we have is the headline uh, priorities, all we have the commitments, uh, and you have list, uh, listed out five uh, priorities within the programme for government commitments that, that relate to the Department of Justice. But what we don't see is actually how that fits over your submission. Uh, do you have that detail, or was that not asked for by the Department of Finance? It wasn't asked for as part of the document, but what the document does is refer to the departmental website, and in the next couple of days we will put on the departmental website the equality information that we've referred to, and it will also include an overview of what the draft budget might mean for the department, and that, I think, covers quite a range of our arms length bodies, so that should be available in the next couple of days. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for the presentation so far. Um, much has been covered. There was um, a point there about the tackling parliamentarism, and um, the money had been removed centrally and put into the department's coffers, um, so you don't have to bid for that. I just want to understand the rationale behind that. But I'd also just like to err, uh, you know, there does seem to be something very fundamentally wrong here. Um, everything seems to be retrospective, you know, responding to a situation, and particularly now, there's no evidence of any long term planning in terms of budget and any external um, factors. And, and I appreciate this is not within the department's control, but, you know, the EU exit and COVID. They're all additional pressures on a system that is already a reactive one and doesn't have any long term. So I don't envy your task, but um, I just would like whenever the the draft budget is presented, you talked about that earlier piece that you do with stakeholders. So while it's not their final position, um, it seems that there is a running commentary with those stakeholders in terms of where their finances are and what the effect of a reduction in that finance would be. And in then coming up with the draft budget that's presented, does the finance minister take time to recognise the consequences of the reduction in that draft budget? Because not only are we not in a position that appears to honour political agreements, it, it appears that there's really... Um, early room to stand still in terms of where we're going because there's no inflationary scope or room in this. So I just appreciate your view on the process and whether you feel, because I, I genuinely believe you're in a, in a very undesirable position of reacting to very, very short term numbers for short, you know, short periods. Thank you. Um, I suppose in terms of the consequences of the draft budget, we would fed in to DOF officials as part of the information gathering and discuss that with DOF officials in terms of what the pressures were, what the impacts were, and that then informed a bilateral between the finance minister and our minister. So again, teasing out what the more significant impacts would be. And at the time of the bilateral, those impacts were based on flat cash. So it was clear at that point that that would have a very significant impact. 
and I suppose all departments would have done something similar in terms of setting the draft budget. So I suppose that's all fed into the process. I don't, there wasn't too much money available at the centre, so I suppose there were difficult decisions to be taken, but it's very clear this has a significant impact on us. As a department, I suppose like most, we're frustrated by a range of one-year budgets, but what we've tried to do is to try to move a wee bit away from that, to try to do some more medium to longer term planning in terms of identifying, you know, what we see over the next number of years. So we have over the last two years gathered three year information to see where we're going. But I suppose there's only so much you can do with that because you know that will identify things people aspire to do. But in the bounds of having flat cash budget, it's very limited in terms of how you can apply it. Um, but just to touch on your tackling paramilitarism point, the eight million pounds that has gone into the DOJ budget this year would normally sit in the Department of Finance. So there's a match funding element. So the bid this year was eight million pounds, which would be matched by funding from Treasury. So there should be a total pot of 16 centrally, which all departments would bid to, including ourselves. So for some reason, they have allocated the eight million pounds, which is not yet matched into the DOJ budget. So we will be seeking under sort of technical arrangements to say, well, actually, you know, that is a, a cross executive programme to which all departments bid. Of course, our department have significant bids to it, particularly for the PSNI and probation, and we will seek to bid for that. But there are ongoing discussions about the match funding element of that, because at the minute, the funding in the DOJ budget only relates to the executive 8 million, which is to be matched by Treasury. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, Doug Beattie. Chair, thank you. A, a, a pretty brief one, if I can, please. Um, and, and along with the Chair and everybody else, I guess, um, I'm also concerned by the budget that you're going to be given and, and the effects it's going to have. But can I just ask, um, with all of these pressures that you're dealing with, have you taken into account the, the factors that you haven't dealt with the pay deal for the Northern Ireland Prison Service yet, uh, and indeed both the probation board uh, and the civil servants within the PSNI uh, are still to have an agreed pay deal. Um, uh, so we're waiting for, for that as part of the pay approval process. Um, and will this budget that's about to come in have a serious effect on that? In other words, are we realigning that proposed deal uh, as, as we move along at the minute? Well, I suppose the estimates of the pay pressure should have been included in the £55.7 million pound pressure, so £21 million of that was pay, and would have been based on estimates of people what people believe the pay deal might be. Right, OK, so so I guess the point that... I, 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 and that's a, that's a straight, straight up a good answer. I suppose the point I'm making is now that if you're saying that's a pressure, um, uh, I take it there will be no, because those pay deals have not been announced, there will be no climb down from those pay deals to try and ease that pressure slightly. That's that's what it is, and that's why it's going to stay. I'm not sure that I'm placed to comment, because I suppose that's part of pay negotiations. Okay, okay. That's, that's fair enough. And the last one, if I can, just on, on what Sinead was saying, uh, very briefly. Um, you said that £8 million for tackling paramilitarism shouldn't sit in the department uh, for justice, and you're right, it should be in the executive office. Did they tell you why they moved it into your uh, into your budget? We did query it, and I think they did say as part of final budgets that mm -hmm. they would take it back to the centre. So it doesn't sit in the executive office. It would be sitting as centrally held funds by the yeah. Department of Finance. Uh, and will they take it back with, when the match funding is sort of agreed, um, or or just it'll just come back centrally naturally? It'll come back as part of the final budget. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions that came to my mind as, as we went through some of the stuff there. And thanks again for, for the answers that you've given so far. Um, I suppose just to recognise, as other members have done, you are in a very difficult position, um, and we accept that. I don't envy us either in trying to, to deal with that, the fact that money was, was given out so late in the year. I also think that we're all in a very difficult position because when we talk about 
I mean, some of the issues that have been raised there around the, the victim's pay scheme for all victims for, of the troubles, um, the ps numbers and, and NDNA commitments, it's all money that was supposed to come from British Treasury. Some of these were British Treasury commitments and they're now telling us that it has to come out of the block grant, which they decide how much we get and they have chosen to give us a flat rate. So I think we need to acknowledge all of that and, and you know, stop ignoring the fact that we're not getting what we're supposed to be getting from the British Treasury. But we have to deal with what we have got and that's an argument for us rather than yourselves as officials who so understand that. Just in terms of the um, PSNA numbers, obviously there, there was money came previously, there, there was the 15 and a half or 16 and a half million, I think it was, in terms of EU exit. And that was before we had EU exit and now they're giving us half that amount when we're in the middle of, of or at the very beginning of, of the EU exit, which just is madness. But PSNA devoted most of that money to um, neighbourhood policing. Have, have they given any indication as to whether that's going to be the area of policing that is likely to lose out here? Because that would create a de great deal of concern. And I agree with actually what, what a number of, of colleagues here in the committee have said about the implications that that would have for confidence in policing, because people want to see people now on the ground dealing with the everyday issues, dealing with the, the break-ins and the drugs and the, the anti-social behaviour and, and all of those issues are the, are the big daily issues for people in their own lives every day. So have you given any indication around that? Um, well, we haven't seen a formal response from the police, but I suppose the main thing is that the conversations with Treasury are ongoing and haven't concluded, and PS and I are continuing to feed into that process. And I suppose what we're seeing now at the minute in terms of ports and the things that are happening that further strengthens the case of the need for PSNI to get the money and we'll feed that back into the case to Treasury. Absolutely, no, appreciate that and thank you and we'll, we'll just keep a close eye on that, Chair, around the, particularly around the neighbourhood policing but I suppose it's, it's an issue for the policing board. Chair, can I suggest that we, we maybe write to the policing board on that issue directly and ask them can they establish and, and can they inform us of what the PSNA plans are around um, where those police numbers might be lost from in terms of whether it will be neighbourhood or, or other areas of policing. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah. There's, um, that email, I'm not sure, and if you had a chance to look at it, did have some illustrative options that the PSNA were considering around over time and, and so on. Um, and I know the Chief Constable gave a briefing to the Policing Board about this earlier today. Um, so yes, listen, that, that's definitely an area that you will want to get feedback from the PSNI and the Policing Board on in terms of what will be the implications of this kind of budget. So I'm more than happy that we would be writing to them to follow up on that. Yeah, that's great, Chair. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. No other members then in terms of any for questions? I just have one for clarity. Um, Lisa, it's on the probation board allocation and um, in terms of what the committee was notified of in December that they had got less than their baseline allocation and that was the only DPD that had got that. Um, but then the probation board submission is suggesting that they've received the full amount of their baseline. So I'm just trying to clear that up if you're able to shed a bit of light on it. I'm not sure what the earlier element about them getting less, less than baseline, anything I'm aware of, anybody would have had their baseline road forward, which is what the probation board should have had. Okay. Okay. Well, can I thank you for coming to the committee today and I'm sure there'll be some follow-up questions that we may want to ask, but thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, so, in terms of then the committee for finance, they're trying to coordinate statutory committees um, on the draft budget, and they've asked for this 
by Friday the 12th of February. Um, so obviously there's a range of issues that members have have expressed concern around in terms of the the allocation to their budgets. Uh, I've outlined one in particular around the place, but I am concerned about the uh, £55 million pounds inescapable pressure, but also um, the NDNA not having received yet um, confirmation around that bid uh, of the £16 million. Pounds. Um, and obviously, again, for me, it's around the PSNI allocation within that in particular. Um, so that th those are certainly areas that I am particularly interested in. Um, I'm not sure if uh, other members you have expressed, I suppose, a range of views on this. Um, we can provide just a summary of the areas that we have discussed um, to the Finance Committee um, and leave it at that by way of a summary, as opposed to trying to get an official committee position on a range of these issues. Um, but I'm happy that we can provide a summary of the areas that we have considered today and, and facilitate that to the Committee for Finance if members are agreeable or if there's anything in particular members want to highlight just at this stage for that purpose. No. Okay. Okay, well then we'll provide them with a summary of the areas that we have discussed today to the uh, Committee for Finance. Then item six is the Criminal Justice um, Committal Reform Bill, the analysis thereof on human rights compliance, pages 199 to 217. At our meeting on the 10th of December, we considered a response from the Human Rights Commission in respect of uh, this bill. We agreed to request details of the analysis of the bill in terms of both ECEHR and international human rights law from the Department. The Department has provided the assessment of ECEHR implications completed by it and the Depart Departmental Solicitor's Office as the bill was developed, and a note on relevant international human rights law which focuses on the elements specifically highlighted by the Human Rights Commission when the Department previously engaged with the Commission on the bill. So it's there for members to note unless there's any further information or clarity required. Otherwise, we'll note it, members. Okay, noted. Um, Item 7 is Domestic Abuse Civil Proceedings Bill in terms of uh, the guidance around this offence, pages 220 to 285. The Department has provided a copy of uh, the guidance that the Department is required to publish under Clause 30 of the Domestic Abuse Civil Proceedings Bill. Uh, a multi-agency task and finish group helped to inform the content of the guidance and agreed the final draft. The Department intends to publish the guidance on its website once the bill has been granted royal assent, which is expected before the end of March. The guidance will be supplemented by operational guidance being prepared by the Police and the Public Prosecution Service for investigators and prosecutors, and the guidance will be kept under review by the Department and revised if necessary in line with the requirements of the legislation. So, again, members, it's there to note the guidance unless there's any further information which the uh, members may have, otherwise we'll note this position. Um, Rachel Woods. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah. Good to see the guidance. I'm just, I know this might seem like a stupid question, but is this the draft guidance, the final draft that the task and finish group has signed off on? That's my... That would be one of my questions. That's my understanding that this is the final draft, okay. yes. And that they they and they have taken the okay with it, that's okay. Um and in terms of the PSNI guidance and PPF guidance, is there a time that that can be expected? Will the committee see that or is that an internal matter? Um and what I suppose my other query is in terms of this guidance obviously is up to the Department of Review. What's the role of the committee? Do we get to look at that? Do we get to see it? Obviously we can't um sort of make any changes to it, but what what is our role in looking at this? If it does need to be reviewed, do we get informed on it? Okay. Well we can ask that as the you know, if the department needs to re review the guidance, you know, what engagement would it have with this committee? If that's to happen, happy that we would ask that. Um, obviously, the operational guidance for the PS and I and PPS, um, I'm assuming, is an internal matter for those two organisations. But nevertheless, we will ask: you know, will we be able to get sight of that? Um, I'm happy that we would do that. And if members are agreeable, we'll also ask the department on the likely time scales for commencing the legislation as well. Um, so, if members Thanks, are, Chair. we'll proceed. Yeah, that's, 
it's just what well, and I suppose just into with the review uh, when it would be reviewed. I know that section 28 um, there's no reference to that in the guidance at all um, it's just in the annex which obviously as you'll understand would be um, an issue that I would be looking to have in the guidance more so than be referred to as an annex in terms of the legal aid um, so if, if that's something that would be then added in by the department as and when they're going through their review of it and the repercussiveness and budget preparation and so on, um, it's certainly something that I noticed that is not in there. Um, and also then just a little bit more, there would be commentary from some organisations, um, I know in terms of is it workable? Um, is this going to be workable for the, for people on the ground? Um, so just just to reflect those comments back to the department. Okay, well, I'm happy to include that if members are agreeable then. Um, okay, thank you. Then item 8, pages 287 to 308. Uh, at our meeting on the 14th of January, the committee received an oral briefing on the proposed LCM in relation to the Protection of Police and Public Courts and Sentencing Bill, the title of which is now changed to Police Crime and Sentencing and Courts Bill. The bill includes a number of provisions relating to devolved matters for which legislative consent will be required. These include amendments to the uh, Crime Overseas Productions Order Act 2019, Enforcement of Scottish Sexual Harm Prevention Orders and Sexual Risk Orders in the rest of the United Kingdom and Statutory Authority or the National Driver Offender Retraining Scheme. Following the oral briefing, the Committee agreed to consider the matter further when the Bill is available and when the Executive has reached a position on the proposal to extend certain provisions in the Bill to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM. The Department has now provided additional information on issues discussed during the oral evidence session and confirmed that the Executive has agreed and considered the proposal to bring forward the LCM. The Department has also advised that there are additional provisions to be included in the Bill which provide powers for the police in England and Wales to apply to the courts for an order to access special procedure material that may relate to the location of human remains. These new provisions mirror existing provisions for obtaining search warrants and production orders within the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984. They ensure that a warrant or order issued by a court in England and Wales under these powers and endorsed by a court in Northern Ireland may, may be executed in Northern Ireland and indeed vice versa. The Department states that the PSNI has confirmed that it is content with these provisions and that the Home Office has advised it expects them to be used uh, very rarely. So, members, this is for noting by way of an update, um, unless there is more information that is required. And then, as uh, previously agreed, the committee would consider the proposed LCM further when the bill and information on time scales for laying the LCM are provided by the Department of Justice. So we will do that upon receipt. Okay, members. Great. Great. Item three, or sorry, agenda item nine, um, page three one zero to three two one. At our meeting on the tenth of September, the committee noted that the Minister was seeking the approval of the Executive for the payment of a recruitment and retention allowance uh, to eligible County Court judges um, for the 2019-20 financial year, arising from a determination made by the Lord Chancellor. The Department advised the Executive approve, approve the payment of the allowance for eligible County Court judges on 5 October last year. But the Minister just wants to highlight that the Ministry of Justice has clarified that the actual salary being used in calculation is higher than previously notified to the executive, and the department has set out the reasons for this. So, members, it is by way of noting the position in relation to the retention and recruitment allowances issue. If members are content to note, Great. noted. Great. Item 10. The minister has written advising that COVID-19 restrictions have limited the activities that a number of projects funded by the 2020-21 Assets Recovery Community Scheme can safely undertake resulting in delays and objectives not being met within planned timescales. COVID-19 has also had an impact on the receipts which fund these schemes. Uh, given the significant impact um, of COVID-19, the Minister agreed on an exceptional basis to provide funding in 2021-22 to those projects that could not be fully delivered in line with the 2020-21 grant. The Minister has also decided to keep under review the receipts coming in from confiscation hearings before opening a new call for applications to the scheme, and that situation will be kept under regular 
review. So members, again, I'm just asking that you would note the position in respect of the 2021-22 um, ARCS financial plans unless there's further information required. Um, I'll also suggest to members that we we'll request details of the projects that have been affected and uh, as a consequence will be funded in the 2021-22 scheme. That information wasn't there but otherwise we will note the position and uh, request that further information. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Correspondence. There are seven items, and uh, I'll draw attention to three of them. A response from the Minister regarding a data breach by the Coroner Service um, in relation to an inquest into the death of Neil McConville, resulting in the identification of former police officers. Um, that breach was brought to the attention of the Committee by the Chairman of the Northern Ireland Retired Police Officers Association, and the Committee considered a response from the Lord Chief Justice on this matter. At the meeting on the 14th of January, we agreed to consider further upon receipt of the Minister's response. So, the Minister has indicated that the Legacy Inquest Unit and the Crown Solicitor's Office have corresponded uh, to seek to address a number of concerns raised by the individuals affected. The Department of Justice Records and Information Management team also carried out an assessment of the incident and follow up actions that were taken. Um, that uh, unit was satisfied that it did not meet the threshold for reporting to the Information Commissioner's Office. So, members, um, that information is there um, for noting. If you are agreeable, we will forward this response um, from the Minister to the Chairman of the Northern Ireland Retired uh, Police Officers Association. Unless members have further comments to make on it. Okay. Um, then there is a letter from the Speaker outlining that he has written to the Minister of Justice advising of Jerry Carroll's uh, public petition in the Assembly, which was laid on the 18th of January in respect of removing of fines for protesters following distancing. And there was an email sent today uh, in terms of the Minister's response to that issue. So members, um, both are there for members uh, to note. Sure. I can come on yes, Paul, just sorry. when the petition is uh, before this committee here on the, the, the item agenda, I would take this opportunity to say that I am really concerned about the way that the police and the chief constable has handled these COVID regulations uh, during this time. They have not been impartial and they have not been fair. And the people who have had fines uh, in my constituency have been family members who have had the audacity to visit their son or their daughter's uh, child or their grandchild's birthday. I have two cases now whereby multiple, fam multiple members of the same family were given £200 fines each. And we all know the publicity and the issue around large gatherings that have not been touched by the PSNI. In fact, uh, the PSNI brought other police from other jurisdictions in to investigate one of them. And that, that is not proportionate, that is not fair, and it is not impartial. And there is massive issues here about confidence of policing that I think the Chief Constable must, uh, must uh, entertain and must deal with. Because whilst we have we are living through the most draconian of laws. The police have shown that they have not been able to apply the law fairly and impartially. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rachel Woods, you wanted in on this item too. Thanks, Chair. Um, no, I was just, with regard to the letter that we'd received earlier on in the table pack, I was just wondering has that been sent to Mr. Carroll as the lead of the um, of the petition? Given if, 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 is that going to go to the Minister of Health then for discussion? So it was just just to put that in. But um, I mean, following on from Mr. Frew's um, points, I, I, I thoroughly look forward to a time that we can discuss this um, with the Chief Constable. And um, I also I do wonder. Um, I note the Minister's point that within the Health Protection Regulations, there is no rescinding or appealing. Uh, maybe that was the case at the time during the Black Lives Matter protests. However, is there are they in now? 
do we have that process involved and what conversations I would like to know um, has ha happened within the Department of Justice because we know that Department of Justice officials are briefing or have briefed the Department of Health um, and the Committee for Health on regulations and are involved with fines. We as a committee might not be, but um, certainly they are involved. So I would, I think there's a wee bit more here that we need to delve into. Um, I'm certainly coming from it from the Black Lives Matter uh, point of view and the fines that were issued last year. Okay. Anyone else just on that particular point? Um, obviously, uh, in terms of the uh, correspondence, the Minister has written back to the Speaker. It will be the Speaker's office that would advise Jerry Carroll of that response because it was laid in the Assembly as opposed to presented to this committee, but it was we are being provided the information because of the, the, the Justice interface. Uh, on the other points around enforcement um, and those offences and so on, I'm quite happy that we would write to the, the Department asking for an update in, in terms of the wider issue of how they're handling those things based upon what you've said, Rachel, and, and to get an update from the Department on that. It may be an area the Committee um, wants to have wider engagement on with the Department um, and the PSNI in respect of that issue, but if you're content in the first instance, um, we will uh, raise the Department uh, with the Department how it's engaging on this and um, how it intends to engage with this Committee on this issue, um, notwithstanding the Health Committee's statutory remit because of the way in, with the the way in which the health regulations are, are primarily um, the vehicle for these matters being taken forward and obviously the Health Committee's role then upon that. Are members happy enough with that approach? Chair? Yes, Linda. Hi. Sorry. Thank you. Um, just a, a, a few comments in, in relation to it. I, I think the the disposal of the the actual fines and, and etc. are dealt with in the same way as any fine of a similar type. They aren't actually different to. So, for example, if, if you know if you're fined for smoking in inside a bar or whatever, they're dealt with in the same way and only the PPS can, can deal with them because I have inquired into this in relation to Black Lives Matter and other issues. So I suppose that's where the, the challenge lies. I think whilst we may well want to look into this issue at times as a committee, the accountability process for PSNA is the policing board. And that's where the accountability mechanism is. That's where the accountability mechanism should be. We are not the accountability mechanism. And I mean, your, yourself, Chair, and, and our colleague Paul, and myself, we all have colleagues that are on the policing board. And I understand, to be fair to Rachel, she doesn't. Um, but we all have colleagues on the policing board who can hold the PSNA to account through that accountability mechanism. Whilst I have no wish writing. To the department on that. Okay, thank you. It may be muted just the last five seconds there, Linda, but I picked up the, the general gist of, of what you were saying. Okay, well if we we'll we will write to the department, you know, around that general issue of the enforcement and so on, um, and then when we get a response we can consider that further. Okay, members. Um, then the final item I wanted just to raise on uh, the correspondence aspect um, relates to a response. Sorry, from the Public Accounts Committee. Um, they've advised that they're unable to undertake a further inquiry into managing legal aid at, the ta at this time. The PSE has provided a copy of the recent memorandums of reply from DOJ in respect of the recommendations. In its 2017 report, further update is due at the end of March of this year, and the PS, uh, PAC will also provide a copy of that when it receives and considers it. So, the committee, um, we have agreed to schedule an oral evidence session with officials on the Business Consultancy Service Interim Report on its review of processes, governance, and, structure, and structures of the Legal Services Agency, the emerging, emerging findings on fraud and error and the LSA Official Error and Legal Payments end of year report, and a date for that is being identified. So if members are content, we will note this response from the Public Accounts Committee.
Great. And if you're agreed, we'll action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet by the clerk. Members agreed with that. Sure. Yes, Linda. Sure. Sorry, can I come in just on another item of correspondence? It's just the item in relation to the um, Communities Committee letter to the Justice Minister about the delay in tenders. I, I would like to see a response. I'd like the committee to get a response back from the Justice Minister in relation to that. If we could re request that from the, the Minister. Okay, we can do that. I think that. The, the suggestion was that we would just forward it on to the Minister. I would actually like to see a response back from, de from the Department, from the Minister. Okay, that's fine. We, we, we can ask for that. Thank you. Okay. I don't have any chairman's business. Is there any other business? If there's no other business that I can see, then our next meeting is on Thursday the 11th of February at 2 p.m. and that will be in room 30 and via the Starley facilities for members. So um, can I thank members for joining with us today? The meeting's adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.